kind of like going to the dentist and you know you need a root canal, but the dentist tells you all the history of your teeth and <laughs> it, it's just like it's too much to get to the main point. Unless you're a self-service tool with a pretty low price point or an average uh, customer value, it doesn't make sense to treat content marketing as synonymous with SEO. I think you're missing a lot of opportunity for partner marketing, for branding, um, for things that feed into dark funnel, but would kind of give your whole company a lift in the long run. I have an idea. Also, oh my God, I'm so sorry I never replied to this. My life got a bit insane the last few weeks. Tommy and Erica's editing a thon, a half day sprint where we edit and explain edits and whatever else seems fun and involves the audience. People can tune in and tune out, but it will be live for X amount of hours. Only thing they have to do to gain access is sign up to your email list. This was a message I got from Erica Schneider on October 18th of this year. And my immediate response was, holy shit, I love it. So here we are. We've had multiple submissions over the last couple of weeks. We have uh, selected 
uh, four of them, and then Erica and I, as a little surprise twist, are going to be editing one of each other's articles, and uh, we are going to go for as long as we need to today to make sure that the edits are going to be as thorough as possible. We'll be going and doing a deep dive. Uh, also, as we're going through, please feel free to leave uh, some comments in the chat, ask any questions that you have as we go along, and I will be uh, sharing the link to the stream, so if you wanted to join us live, uh, you can certainly join us on screen as well. So, that being said, welcome to the Content Studio's first annual, I've decided we're doing this once a year now, uh, Edit-a-thon, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, before we get into it, let me just bring on my co-editor here uh, today. We've got Erica Schneider. She is, well, what are we calling you now? What, like, what's the, what's the business? What's the official Erica Schneider business now, Erica? At the moment, I'm going with editorial consultant and coach. Okay. Um, but that might just change to, like, Schneider Pants LLC in the future. We'll see. Schneider Pants LLC. I love it. I love it. Um, and tell me, what, uh, what, what are you working on these days? Because you just got done with the Power Your Platform. Yep. Right? There's so much going on. Um, I'm kind of having like a, I'm targeting two completely different audiences under the umbrella of organic traffic in one way or another. So it all has to do with words. I'm, I'm coaching people in one-to-one -one group uh, and just kind of uh, my courses for growing your social presence. I call it your personal platform because I hate the term personal brand. And then on the other end of it is what I've done for the past five years, which is working with, uh, again, like individual freelance writers usually, or people that work in-house or teams that want really, really good high quality content and they need either editing help or they need more of like a strategic advisory help of like, how the hell do I even make good content? Like what is good content? So kind of dipping my toes into those areas at the moment. We'll see what, we'll see, uh, we'll see where it evolves. I'm not sure. I think, evolve. I think, I think you're off to a very, very good start already, and that um, <coughs> I'm very excited to see uh, just how you are growing and how everything has grown since we first met. Um, was it over a year ago now? Well over a year ago now. Yeah, Jeez. so it was on my birthday. It was March 29th my God. of 2022. I'll never forget the day. And I bought, Tommy, I bought this microphone, my little Yeti Nano thing. Yeah, yeah. For, for your show. <laughs> I was like, I'm going on a show. I need a microphone. I love it. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, we're going to jump in. Um, we've got uh, four, five guest submitted articles today. Um, one of them is from our uh, friend of the show, Aaron Orendorf, long friend of mine. Uh, we also have, let me just see here, who else do we have? Uh, Naveen, you are actually in the audience right now. You are asking, so we do have podcast consistency. doesn't have to be hard. Uh, we also have Anki Vora, who is a... Uh, also a good friend of mine, uh, 10 best AI tools for reaching your sales goals. We have uh, Kiran. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce Kiran's last name. Eric, can you, can you help me out with this one? I think it's Shahid. Shahid. All right, cool. Kiran Sorry Shahid. Sorry if I've totally, totally butchered that. We do our absolute best. Um, so then we've got Kiran. We've also got Jasmine Jade O, uh, who has now considered calling herself Jasmine is my name. <laughs> on Twitter, uh, that's the best. As as a as a response to this, um, <laughs> but first up, we're gonna start with Aaron Orendorf, uh, submitted from Recart, and I'm gonna just jump over to the screen here, and we can get started. So, uh, first, I'm gonna share this also inside the chat with you all. So, if you want, you can join us in the chat. You can follow Where's the on. chat, Tommy? Is it just this chat? Uh, no, you can't, you can't see the chat. I can see okay, the chat. cool. Sorry. It's okay. Let's see. And uh, things are... Okay, I'm not actually going to share this in the chat. Yeah, because we're going to have problems if we do. Perfect. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, the article is called Black Friday SMS Marketing Your 2023 E-Commerce template from the company Recart. Uh, they are an SMS e-commerce provider and uh, they're doing some pretty cool stuff actually. The product's really neat. If you are in e-commerce, I highly recommend you check it out. 
So as we start here, uh, the challenges of this year's holiday season couldn't be greater, nor the stakes higher. For D2C brands who've seen cost rise, sales plateau, and margins erode, you need every advantage you can get. And you need th those advantages as quickly, as profitably, and as light on resources as possible. That's what this guide contains, sort of. SMS marketing isn't a magic bullet. It's not a standalone strategy. In fact, compared to honing your Black Friday promotions and Cyber Monday deals, text message marketing won't make or break your e-commerce business. Erica, what do you think about this introduction already? <coughs> so I really like um, like the casual quirkiness of it. Mm -hmm. It's got my attention. What I don't love is the first line, even though the second line makes it better. But I think because I've just looked at a thousand of these drafts, anything that starts with something that purports that the challenges of a thing couldn't be greater just kind of makes me go like, mm. you know, like, I, I don't know, but I don't know if that's me because I've read a thousand of these mm. or if, if not, but um, I look at that and I'm like, every holiday season is difficult. What makes this one special, right? Like yeah. why, what is the point of this line? Um, when you tell me that something can't be harder and the stakes can't be higher and then um, you don't make it super, super obvious right away what that means and why, I'm just wondering why is this here? And is that something where we should move it lower where we have places to expand the context? I think, um, yeah. I th th that's kind of what's standing out to me on this is that um, it's again it's a show don't tell situation right you're telling me that the stakes are high um, yeah. but even if we just from a structural standpoint move this third paragraph up right mm -hmm. now we're going okay the the brands seen costs rise sales plateau margins erode da 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 the challenges couldn't be greater the stakes could be higher that's what this guide is about yeah. Um, Generally speaking, like with with I agree with you on that, too. I think that um, and I was just wondering the same thing. Is, is it because I've seen a million of these or is it, <laughs> is it because that's the case? But I think I no. I mean, I, from an audience perspective, I think if as a reader, I would probably say the same thing. Everybody's telling me, especially if you're in the e-commerce space this time of year, everyone's telling you how high the stakes are. We already know mm -hmm. how high the stakes are. Let's assume that that's uh, that's let's assume that that's known and then yep. probably move into it with um you know what i'd really like to know is this guide right here this guide is it's not a sms marketing isn't a magic bullet right yep. it's not a standalone strategy in fact i would love to start digging in with something along those lines i was going to say the same thing because if you look at the first part of this intro you don't know that this is about sms messaging right. at all but that's what the whole guide is going to be right and sms messaging is i mean i don't i don't know all the details but i don't i don't think it's always been as popular as it is now mm -hmm. well based on reading aaron's content on social i feel like it's it's having a moment or he's at least get, telling me it is when i believe him um so I feel like that's kind of a really big differentiating factor because this these first couple paragraphs could be the start to any type of Black Friday messaging, yeah. right? So if SMS is the way that we're gonna stand out and that's what you're selling me and that's what's gonna help me, you know, get over the challenges that couldn't be greater with these super high stakes, like lead with that, right? Yeah. Um, also, I've probably typed that into Google one way or another. So just get right to it is also my my gut check there. Yeah, I think the thing, and this is actually, if we cut all of this, right, I'm just gonna say, let's put this in suggestion mode. If we cut all of this, this actually plays into something I was talking about on LinkedIn not too long ago too, where it's, um, you're now going Black Friday SMS marketing, your 2023 e-commerce template, that's the first thing somebody reads. The second thing they're gonna read is SMS marketing isn't a magic bullet. So you started that immediately with reversal um, yep. and now the rest of it's like, oh, this is an SMS marketing company who's telling me that SMS marketing is not a magic bullet. Yep. All right. Now we're now, now you've got me, uh, I'm already in, right? 
it's not a standalone. Yeah, it's a bit of reverse psychology. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, just from from what we see in the marketing space in general, anything marketing related, when you say this marketing thing is not the end all be all, like, oh, okay, somebody who's not buying into their own BS, <laughs> fantastic. I know, it's amazing. <laughs> I love it. I love to hear it. All right. Let's... Um, carry on. All right, let's keep going. Uh, so it's not selling strategy. What SMS will do is add incremental revenue to every click, visitor, shopper, and customer your holiday campaigns will touch. That is what this guy campaigned. I yeah. love that. I love that too. I really do. It's um, it's nice and punchy and it gives you this like pretty strong idea of like, that's what, it's very clear signposting. Something, totally. Something that they do here on the structural standpoint too. Um, there are two things, there's a thing that I like and a thing I don't necessarily like. Um, okay. They do a really good job of right here in the stage one, uh, stage two, stage three, stage four, like this very quick, quick at a glance. Now in the draft here, I've done my absolute best to, um, if, if you see me scrolling here, uh, start to put in like the little call out windows that they have. I've tried to replicate those in the draft. There's quite a few, um, which makes sense, but there's also a lot of call outs. So I would look at that probably a little bit more closely. Mm -hmm. But okay, so stage one, pre-holiday setup and list growth. We start this from now, October 31st to uh, as quickly as possible. There's no wrong time to start building your subscriber list and setting up your SMS strategy, but there is a right time. Okay. Okay. Now before the largest e-commerce sale period of the year. Now before the largest. <laughs> E-commerce sale period of the year. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so if I'm reading this right now, right? Yeah. And obviously the time is now, then I just feel like you can tell me the time is now. Okay. Like, I I don't, again, like, I feel like it's a bit of, it's a bit of filler to tell me there's no wrong time. Like, I would rather start with, or the urgency yeah. because if the time is now, tell me the time to set up your list is now. If you've been building one throughout the year, like kudos, but the action point is now, whatever that type of, of phrasing is. Um, obviously this copy that I'm spitballing is not good, but it's just the idea. Right. Um, so again, like if I'm, if I'm coming in here as the reader and I'm reading this right now, I, I just, I think it's a bit of wasted real estate at the top of a, an H2 to tell me there's no wrong time to start building your subscriber list. Because if I haven't built it yet, that might make me nervous. Like are people ahead of me? Right. Right. Um, so you just want to keep that, that kind of in mind, every type of person that's going to be reading this. If you're trying to capture people that are brand new to doing this and they need to do it right now and they need to get started right now, or if they've been building it, um, speak to both of them. Cause if I'm in that list where I haven't been building it, that might freak me out a bit. Like, and then I might, I might feel like, uh, like, I don't know if I, it, maybe I missed the boat type thing. Right. Yeah. I, uh, I totally agree with that. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, there's no wrong time, but there is a right time now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's just say now, uh, Ryan says, I would almost say there is a wrong time to build a list, but here's how you can catch up. I actually, I like that a lot, Ryan. Um, mm -hmm. where it is, yeah, if you're behind, then we can say like, you're, you're assaging those fears a little bit of like, yeah, maybe you are behind, but here's how you can catch up. I like yep. that. I like that too. All right, cool. Preparation is the key to success. This couldn't be any more true for your SMS marketing because the proper, proper opt-in is vital to having an engaged first party subscriber list. So go ahead. You sounded like you, had uh, something you wanted to join in there. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm trying to digest it. Like anytime that I have like one of those moments where I'm, I, I kind of do this and I like furrow my brows. I'm like, wait, what did that mean? Yeah. Um, that's usually a sign to me that that could have been said in a, just a little bit more of a straightforward way. Um, so just the sentence, this couldn't be more true for your SMS marketing because the proper opt-in is vital to having an engaged first party subscriber list. 
you know, when you read it out loud. <laughs> what? That's a, that when you read it out loud, it actually doesn't sound. Um, it doesn't sound natural. That's what I. That's what I mean. It's yeah. it's tripping me up a bit. Um, so if I was like, if I was doing a developmental read, right, um, just to kind of give tips and tactics, if there's any future budding editors in here, I I would leave myself a comment here and say like, this is tripping me up. Um, like circle back to make it more straightforward, something like that, because you don't necessarily want to be making copy edits at this stage, right? but you do want to leave notes for yourself that you're struggling with something. There's nothing wrong with the, with the, with what it's trying to say, but, but it's, it's tripping me up. I feel like there's a way it could be clearer. Yeah. So here's something interesting too, because we, um, so we, and then get this set up ASAP and don't leave them later than October. There's uh, clearly this is like, this was published ahead of today. Right, November seventh. Yeah. Um, but when we're thinking about the timing of it all, if somebody is coming across, because this is very clearly so optimized for search to Black Friday SMS marketing, yeah, there is this level of like fear of missing out, right, or like fear of lateness coming into that. But as somebody who's coming in and seeing this on October seventh or November seventh, rather than October, you know, later than October. Is mm -hmm. there a way that we can think about the time aspect of this, either when we publish in the first place, um, or that's like, how do we make this so it's like, this is the most urgent thing without necessarily saying, if you're doing this later than October, you're screwed. I mean, like, kind of already know that we're screwed, but how do we, yeah. how do we do that? Well, something else that just, just going back to the original edit of, there's no wrong time to start building your subscriber list, but there is a right time. But now we're but, saying there's a wrong time. But now we're saying there's a wrong time, right? Right. So um, just, just logically, it's also a little bit confusing. So I think the way that you, that you set it up is you ease people more into this stage one thing. And you say, look, like the best time to set up your list is before October. But if you need to do it now, like you're fine, you got this. This is like, I'm, I'm going to show you like how to set it up right now if you need to, and also how to set yourself up su for success for next year. And that makes it a bit more evergreen. Right. Um, if that's truly the message that they're trying to get across here. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's something that we, that I would want to address that. Um, okay. So enable SMS opt-in at checkout. Cool. Uh, Nevin says way too many, ne too many negative verbs. Ah, mm -hmm. you, you think so? I mean, there's definitely a lot of don't do this, couldn't, couldn't that um, before this. I mean, it's this whole section is definitely making me feel like shit. And <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, that, if that's intentional, that's fine. But again, like, I just think there's a way to reframe it a tiny bit where it's like, yeah, like get, get, you know, get it going. But also I'm going to like support you. Well, here's, if you're... here's something interesting, right? Because um, the brand is actually uh, <coughs> the much the much bigger context of the brand, and I only know this because I know the, the, the company, um, is a lot more friendly, right? And what, I, what I'm interested, if I, if I kind of take a step back here and we look at this from a more broad perspective, Erica, you probably see this as well as I do, um, where there's a lot of brands out there who are like, they're friendly, but they don't, and they, but they do make you feel what you're talking about, but in like the friendliest way possible. Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you, what would you say like about that in general? Because it's like, there's, there's definitely that, like, you're being really mean to me in a really nice kind of way. Right. And not really mean. <laughs> I mean, this isn't mean by any stretch of the imagination, but it's, um, it is something where I'm kind of feeling like, like, wow, wow, you just really nicely told me that I'm really behind. I don't mind that. I mean, it's definitely following like the PAS type of yeah. framework, right? What the pro prop that, that stands for problem agitate solution if, if you don't know that in the audience. But um, I don't mind it. I also especially don't mind it if they have audience research and knowledge that 
people are really messing this up and they're waiting too long. Mm. Right. And they need, they need this kick in the butt. Um, but that depends on the audience and where they're at. You, you don't want to do that to people that genuinely don't know what they don't know. Um, you do want to do that to people that know it and need, and need a little kick. Like I do that all the time in various forms of my writing for people that I know that you know this, but you're not doing it right. And that's, that's, that's fine. So that's one of those things where I would have to know a bit more about the audience because it can, it can work the opposite way. It can make people feel like they've missed the boat um, or they're too late or imposter syndrome kicks in or whatever it is. And they just, they just end up not feeling empowered. The trick is to make people feel empowered. Yes. I like that. Okay. So we're going to enable SMS opt-in at checkout. Uh, Time is going to take five minutes. I love this. By the way, you don't see this nearly enough in uh, step-by-step guides in general, how long it's going to take and like yeah. the time frame in which to do it. Like this is a very time sensitive piece. So if we're assuming that this was published well in advance, right, then we've got this nice time frame on which you should do things, which I think is great. Um, I love it. I've never seen that before. So mm-hmm. that's really cool. No, I think, I mean, I think this is wonderful. Um, yeah. Without enough SMS subscribers, your efforts in setting up campaigns and flows <laughs> go to waste. <laughs> Well, okay. See ya. Um, I forgot to do this already, so now I'm setting this up, <laughs> and I am uh, a month and five days behind. Crap. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go ahead and do that because yeah. it's just at this point we've we've done that now. We've done that in the intro, yeah, and we've done that in the setup. Like, don't. There's no need to do it again. Like, you're just <laughs> you're just like poking a bruise. Um, also, like you're telling me this is going to take me five minutes. Like you've just taken 10 seconds out of that five minute. Like just, just let's just get, let's go, you know, right. like tell me what to do. Um, just tell me what to do. Just get to it. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So for quick list growth and, and that's actually, so just tell me what to do in the step-by-steps and how to's in general. Um, I like that this is actually getting into the, here's how you do it. A lot of, a lot of um, how to's don't actually tell you how to, they just tell you what, this is actually yep. doing a really good job at telling you how to. Yep. And I appreciate that so, so, so much. Um, so for quick list growth, start with converting high intent visitors at checkout because these soon to be customers are already buying opt-in skyrocket. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, okay. I think this is really clear. I think a lot of this is really clear. Um, best part, this feature is natively available on the Shopify checkout. I think this is super clear. Um, mm-hmm. The only thing I would say maybe with this and some of the other, you know, other little bits is that mm, I was going to do that. Yeah. Like the rhetorical was questions gonna do that. in general, that's something I don't really love. Um, especially if we're going step by step five minutes, like, you know, this has a chance to be a really snappy piece. Uh, yes. So let's see. Okay. You can customize your SMS opt-in text. It's a little known secret. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yep. Uh, Shopify buyers from under the theme, so let's search Mess SMS. Click. Yep. Cool. Yep. Advocating SMS at checkout takes uh, less than five minutes. For, or activating SMS at checkout takes less than five minutes. That totally feels like it takes less than five minutes, too, just by mm-hmm. putting it all together like that. That is something um, I don't see nearly enough in a lot of other places. Um, Erica, can you say something to me real quick here? Yeah. Am I still here? Yeah. Uh, someone's saying that they're having a hard time hearing you. Me? Yeah. I don't think it's you. I think it's my levels. Oh, okay. Uh, audience, please let me know if that is, um, if that helps. Yeah, I'm here. So let me know if you can hear me. <laughs> there we go. Oh, my yeah. sound is much lower. Oh, you can barely hear me. Oh, they can oh hear I can hear you just, I can hear you just fine. They can't hear me. Oh. All right. Audience, let me know if that's any better. Hopefully, hopefully I don't blow your microphone or blow your eardrums out after turning <laughs> my microphone up. Um, okay, cool. So, okay, you can hear Erica fine. You can't hear me. Hopefully this has changed. I'm going to continue, but I'm keeping my eye on the chat. Okay, cool. Fine now. Perfect. Okay, cool. Cool. See? Live, folks. Live. I love it. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that. 
Uh, okay, so activating SMS checkout takes less than five minutes. Yeah, so in a lot of step-by-step -step guides, I think that um, it, it doesn't feel as snappy as it could be. And mm -hmm. I love when it actually feels like I love when the writing and the steps feel as smooth as it says it's going to be. So this is like, um, I think this is perfect. I think this is perfect yeah. in that regard. Uh, okay. So step two, set up and convert, uh, with direct to text. Oh, taking a step back here though, for a second, something I'd be curious to know, and maybe this is approached later on in the piece, right? We're talking about enabling SMS opt-in at the checkout. I want to know early, early in the process. Um, we've got pre-holiday setup and list growth. I want to know earlier in the process, is it possible for me to import my existing contacts into this? So even if I am behind, I can still mm. catch up, even if it's not with my brand new customers. Yep. Right. That's so that's something that's kind of standing out to me right there. And maybe that's, maybe that's stage zero, right? Import yeah. people uh and then moving forward from there i will say tommy when you lean forward i can hear you less you can hear me less now i hear you better now you can hear me better yeah all right how was that folks <laughs> <laughs> all right uh so to set up and convert 2x with direct to text okay time okay. takes 15 minutes below average list growth eats away at your bottom line especially when you're paying for expensive holiday traffic. A modest lift in opt-ins from 3.5 to 4.75% doesn't sound like much. Oh, yeah, it does. Um, yeah. This is something where I would say I would actually reverse. And re I, would, I was going to say, yeah. say the same thing. Go ahead. <laughs> Start with this, I would say. Start with is that? that what you're gonna oh, no, I was going to say something like um, at 100,000 visitors per month, I would actually start here. And then not even need to say, like, I would start from the bigger number and then say, if you were to add 3.5 to 4.75%. So I don't have to go with, that doesn't sound like much. Yeah. I'd actually say, like, here's 100,000 visitors you already have. But now, if you're increasing that by 3.5 to 4.75%, that's an additional blah, blah, blah. Totally. I'm with you there. I was going to say, just, just either get rid of this or put it down like right like this is the <clears throat> this is the bottom line up front like this is answering directly why and how i can 2x with direct to text basically in this sentence it's really compelling and then you can tell me if you want to that the reason to do this is because um it's really expensive to pay for holiday traffic yeah so uh, but i don't know or just get rid of it in general and just get right to it which is the, the most compelling bit which is here yeah, I would actually, I would say get rid of that um, yeah. because below average list growth, this is one of those things where it's as, especially as a reader, like I know this, I know that below yeah. la average list growth eats away at my bottom line. Yeah. Right. The um, part that's potentially compelling is like, what do people have to invest for, for holiday traffic? Right. right? So like, if, if I don't know that, if I know theoretically that, I want to capture SMS um, marketing for holidays, but I, I'm not entirely sure what it's going to cost me. <clears throat> Depends on the awareness level of the reader, right? Because it could be really interesting to know you can gain this many people and that's huge because to pay for it, you know, it would be X, Y, or Z. Right. Yeah. I think that's a really solid point because um, I would, I would lean into the paid traffic element of it. Yeah, but that in, in, as it's written right now, especially when you're paying for expensive holiday traffic, that kind of throws away the emphasis exactly of how expensive Black Friday traffic can be. And it is insanely expensive. Anyone. And I will just say this for anybody who's on a SMS marketing uh, for e-commerce site, pretty sophisticated reader um, in regards to that anyways, because SMS is like kind of fringe. It's not kind of I mean, it's it's not core to SM or it's not core to e-commerce. So like, yeah, you know, so I would say it's still a pretty sophisticated thing. So yeah, I would live, I would lean into that expensive holiday traffic and then saying like, yeah. And if you improve, if you have a hundred thousand visitors per month, you're paying for X amount of those. And then three and a half to 4.75, that's an additional 370 or 3,750, you know? Yeah. Those are more people like that's a lot. Um, okay. Sadly, 
Most common, common e-commerce stores kill conversions through complexity, confusion, and too many clicks. Mm. Mm. Do we need that? Mm. I mean, I pro I probably know that already as the reader. Like, that's why I'm here, because I want to learn how to not do that. But if you're going to say something like this, I would rather you reverse it and say, <clears throat> but you're not going to grow your list. Like, you're not going to achieve this paragraph that I just told you, like, is like the dream. If you use these bad habits that you've been used to. Right. right. Like, frame it that way. So because this right now feels like it's disconnected from this. Right. So it, sh it should all be connected. Like, this is what you can achieve. But don't be an idiot like you've been, which is why you're reading this guide. I'm here to help you. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and then I would want to know, like, okay, so now this is this is a, a something that I'm gonna just I'm gonna just go into right now, real quick. So this drives me a, a bit crazy. I don't know in this screenshot if you're telling me that this is the good or the bad version. Mm. So if you read underneath it, substantial SMS list growth and therefore substantial substantial SMS sales over the holidays come from optimizing three types of pop-ups, each designed to... Okay, obviously this isn't... This got cut off or, or something, but... Oh, no, it's coming next. Each designed to meet visitors natively. So wait, so substantial SMS sales come from optimizing three types of pop-ups. Again, I don't know if this is a good pop-up or a bad pop-up based on this sentence. Mm. All right, we're going to... I'm going to... We're just, so we're, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say uh, something to the effect of paying for expensive holiday traffic. Most e-commerce stores kill conversion through complexity and confusion. But if you were to increase your, you know, if you had 100,000 visitors, the, the lift that you're missing right now from 35 to 4.75%, that's what you're missing out on right now. Here are some examples of how you can do that better with pop-ups. Totally. And get rid of this screenshot because this is too early. Right. Yeah. Unless you want to pretext, pre-context me with like here, here's like just quick fire examples, a couple of like the ways that most of you do it wrong. Right. Um, and then here's how we can do it right. Well, other, but, but honestly, I think for flow, I would just remove this. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I would say we've got right here, like the avoid asking for too much information. But like, that's, oh, okay, that's so. it's, I mean, that's it's, but it's minor. It's such small text that it's like, is that the something it, it's not going to capture your attention. So yeah. like you got to signpost it earlier, kill it. And I like to kill it. All right. Uh, substantial SMS list growth and therefore substantial SMS sales over the holidays come from optimizing three types of pop-ups, each designed to meet visitors natively. Okay, cool. Pop-up type one, desktop email, then SMS pop-up by two. Mobile email, then SMS. Pop-up type three, mobile SMS only, direct to text. I like these. I'm, I mean, maybe I'm not the reader, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely, personally, I'm just feeling like, I'm personally just feeling a little like lost on the three different types. Yeah, me too. That might also just be because I'm not in e-commerce right now. <laughs> I've never been in e-commerce, so I'm 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 quite I'm quite lost on these three types. Um, so, with from a clarity perspective, then in that case, right? Because it, <coughs> it it very clearly is telling us what the type of thing is. Is this a, a, a situation where? Well, this is this is an audience versus uh, this is the audience versus information balance, right? Yeah. Um, as a non-audience member, I might want a little blurb in here that says desktop email, then SMS, right? Just a little dis description of the flow. But if I'm in the audience and I know what this is, cause you know, we, we just said before, like, this is mm -hmm. something that we've established, like the audience itself is fairly established. What do you think? What would you, what would you do here? What would your, what would your take be? I, I always think that even if the audience knows it, you should still give them a bit just in case. Okay. Or if they need to be like convinced a bit more, yeah. I would probably, I mean, at the very least, I would probably add 
why these three type of pop-ups are the best way to optimize your SMS list growth. Just like one more sentence even. Okay. Like these these three work the best based on based on what? Also like if it's if it's, if it's industry common knowledge cool, but if it is then like you should be able to back that up with something. Like is there anything to prove this? Mm. If if there's any part of me that needs to be convinced, there's nothing here that that convinces me that these are the three types I should go with. So Generally, I would I would say you should follow the claim support takeaway takeaway model, which is like you're claiming right now that this is the best way to do a thing. You're supporting it with examples, but you're you haven't given me the the actual data behind the example or the anecdote mm. or the first party data or something like why do I believe you here? Okay. Um, again, unless it's the most common industry knowledge in the world that I'm just unaware of, and then I guess that would be a cap like a one of those one of those asterisks asterisks where it wouldn't matter all right yeah and i think the transition into so we've got set up and convert 2x with direct text the the transition then into the pop-up types like set up and convert 2x with direct text and then we go straight to pop-ups mm -hmm. i think there could be a little bit set up of what a little bit more set up like you're talking about here to then recap recalibrate with that yeah someone says as snell says it's not clear yeah, yeah um yeah i mean i think it could it it could benefit from probably a little bit more clarity i do know that the audience is probably more up on this than i am but it does i think it does require a little bit of context that's right so to get the most out of your pop-ups okay set a time delay of five to ten seconds rather than bombard your visitors the moment they arrive cool Offer an incentive. Yep. Make everything clear mm -hmm. and clickable. Yeah. I like the clarity of a lot of this. I think what I'm having a hard time bridging the gap on uh, right now is just this, connecting this to this, making the whole thing feel a little bit more connected in the entire um, sentence or in the entire yeah. section. Yeah. And Sunil says, and I ran an e-commerce store and do marketing, so they're part of the audience. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think there could just be a little bit more cohesion between the different elements of this particular section. There's also quite a few claims, um, especially the last two here in this bulleted list. So a bonus discount for the second opt-in keeps the momentum going and this doubles conversion rates versus requiring both email then SMS. It seems like the writer has knowledge that they're not backing up with again data or something that can prove this or tell me why so if i was if i was editing i would certainly wrap this in a comment and say can you prove this mm. where does this come where does this come from um because that is quite a claim all right so i've got a question for you and this is not related to this piece but just something that i hear in general um because mm -hmm. i get to have a nice broad perspective of different uh viewpoints on this um, there is a, uh, almost a rally against, I don't want to say against, but there's definitely uh, a lot more folks saying like, do you have to back everything up with a stat, right? Everything mm -hmm. with a stat, everything with a stat. Tell me what your take on that is now, because I think what a lot of us have, and I can see this evolution from <coughs> when I started doing it at CXL years ago, where nobody yep. was backing anything up with research. To then, you know, we were backing a lot of stuff up with research, and because our blog was popular, um, I, we saw a lot more people starting doing that afterwards. And maybe it was just, you know, I bought a red car, and now everybody else drives a red car too. Um, but I think we've also gone too far in a direction where it's like point quote stat point <laughs> quote stat. To the point, and I saw this in one of the other articles that we didn't end up bringing onto the show today, where it's like too many statistics. What's that balance look like in your head? Like, what does that look like in your mind? I'm so glad you brought this up because I was going to bring it up at some point because I was thinking about this a lot last night. Okay. And I went down a, a rabbit hole. I was like three glasses of wine in, and this is what I do in my spare time, by the way. So don't, <laughs> don't judge me. <laughs> Um, you know, I'd watched enough Dateline for the night and I was like, what should I watch next? My wife went to sleep. So I go, of course I go to YouTube and I just, I just type Editing in story. Stuff. 
<laughs> editing stuff. No, I, I typed in, I literally typed in storytelling versus data mm. because this has been on my mind like crazy lately because it's, it's a thing. Um, it's a, it's a shift I'm noticing. So, okay. I think that we rely on data way too much and it's so, so, so boring. Yeah. Um, especially if it's like the main point of your argument is like, I'm not going to back this up in any way, except saying like in a Harvard research study, you know, 75% of the, yeah. um, and then that's why you should believe me. And now I'm an expert, right? Like, I think that's really boring. I understand why we started to do it because you can't just make a zillion claims. Um, I think that it's way more interesting, especially with the shift to losing trust in brands mm -hmm. and trusting more in people. It's way, way more interesting to talk about what you've seen anecdotally. And then just even if you just admit like anecdotally, this is what we've noticed as a business or this is how people are interacting with our business. I think that's even more interesting than, you know, based on this stat from 2018, this happens to double your rate, except we only like talk to 50 people about, it. you know, it's like, yeah, it, it's it's not it's not very compelling. So when I say this here, this doubles conversion rates, you could literally say at, at Recart, like we've, we've seen in our own like data or most of our customers that have done it this way have, you know, on average doubled conversion rates. Like that, that would to me be the absolute perfect way to say this. You do not have to go find some stat that proves that overall across the entire industry, it doubles conversion rates. But if you're, if you, if you're telling me that you've noticed that this method for you and people in your circle, it works for them. Like that at least tells me something. It brings me a little bit more into your, into your trust sphere, so to speak. Circle, um, of, trust. circle of trust. There you go. But I think the reason why, is, uh, in general, I mean, I spend a lot of time on social these days, and and everyone makes up stats there. It's it's really right. insane. Everyone <laughs> everyone's better than ninety nine percent of everyone, right? And so, um, I I think I I also have a bit of an aversion to just throwing something out there without backing it up with something. Yeah. Um, because why should I believe you? There, there there's a fine line between why should I believe you and why should I believe this old stat? Like right. we kind of need. The, the industry needs to find like a like a nice middle ground. And I think we can. I think the answer is, is a bit of first party data and customer stories and stuff like that. I like what you're saying there, especially because it is um, bringing in that first party, like bringing in the first party stuff is it adds that little layer of credibility. Something someone was asking me about this not too long ago. And um, the thing that I said is that I like to use research to support something you already felt to be true. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. It's not believe me because I know somebody else said this thing. It's like, here's this thing that you've probably been thinking about. Actually, yeah, here's the research that backs that up. <clears throat> not yep. here's the research and then here's other research and then here's other research. It's like this is intuitive. But like yeah. that hunch that you had or like if you were doubting a little bit, here's some research that, you know, supports that hunch. Um, totally. I want to close close the loop I opened actually with the YouTube thing because I wrote sure. down the one I the one I ended up watching and it blew my mind. Um, it was titled "Why Storytelling Is More Trustworthy Than Presenting Data." Yeah. Um, and it was I couldn't I didn't catch her name. It was a, it was a woman, and the gist of it was um, if you want people to actually act on data, like people logically they see data and they're like, okay, that that must be true. It's data. Um, but it doesn't mean that they're going to do anything with that data. So if you want them to actually act on that data, the best way is to wrap it in a story. Um, mm. And I'm sure everyone watching this knows that, but the way that she broke down how to do that, she, I think she was speaking primarily about speeches, but it, it translates to writing just the same. Um, I highly recommend watching that YouTube video because it was like the best 30 minutes ever. And then I happily went to sleep. <laughs> Well, can you um can you put that in our chat here, and then I will put it into the group chat here for the audience. Yeah, cool. Yes. And I'm actually going to put in the link to uh, the video here. So if anybody wants to join us live, you have the opportunity to do so uh, by clicking on that link. I will let you into the lobby if you'd like. Karen Eber, why does she sound familiar? I don't know. I don't know. Um, someone else here says too. Ryan says uh, I've written articles with three x's, 
3x the statistics of others really comes down to how resistant you think they will be to the behavior change. What depends mm. on the ask plus their awareness and sophistication. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's a whole conversation that we could have around stats in general, but generally speaking, I, I like to, oh I try to support like that intuition with here's some research that backs up whatever your intuition is on that. All right. Tommy, I'm, ha I'm having a moment here live and on camera. Uh oh. In a good way. I just went to LinkedIn because this this Karen Eber woman sounds familiar and we are connected. So she knows who I am and I am now her biggest fan. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. That is so cool. The value of a personal brand, people. Internet. By the way, Power Your Platform, Cohort 1 just locked, but uh, we <laughs> Cohort 2 will be launching at some point in the uh, oh future. Uh, so, so cool. I'm putting the YouTube okay. link right here in the chat for anybody else who would like to see it. All right, moving forward, showcase and sell with your welcome flow. Okay, this takes 30 minutes. Okay, so something just on a meta level here, um, something I'm actually really enjoying about the structure of this piece, right? Um, we've got 15 minutes here on step two. We've got five minutes here. We've got 30 minutes below. So now we're starting to like, what I really love about this structure is that it's easing you into mm. the harder stuff mm -hmm. and it's still doing it in a way that's like feels manageable each time so uh let's see showcase and sell with your welcome flow okay the opt-in journey doesn't end when you've got a new subscriber sending a multi-part welcome flow is a non-negotiable next step okay welcome flow messages greet your new subscriber and engage them right away okay welcome flow i mean this line to me feels a little self-evident be honest with you yeah maybe so i would probably combine these first two sentences okay. because you're saying you're saying the same thing basically um right you're saying the journey doesn't end and the next part of the journey is also non-negotiable because the journey doesn't end it's it's sort of similar mm -hmm. so i would probably combine them to save some real estate and just say like once you've got a new subscriber, like you the you need to send a multi part welcome flow or and then maybe like hit them with a or else. Right. right? Or like if you don't send a multi part welcome flow once you've got a new subscriber, this is what could this is like the problem you could run into. Um like this isn't this isn't making me feel if you're telling me that it's non negotiable, but I'm, I don't, you know, like, I, I feel like there's, you could make me feel more here. Right. Yeah. Um, and not in quite the same, like, hurtful way as we get, not hurtful. <laughs> that's not the right word. It's not, it's not, it's not that serious. But yeah. Yeah. No, there is definitely a way to, yeah. I like that. All right. So we've got yeah. actually someone in the lobby right now. Uh, oh, nice. Naveen is in the lobby. At least Naveen was in the lobby. Uh, I don't see Naveen in the lobby now. Nope. No more Naveen in the lobby. Although, if you would like to join, uh, go ahead and use the link in the chat again, and I will make sure that you come on this time. OK, uh, so yeah, welcome flow. Uh, a sequence of three to five texts does the job perfectly each with conditional splits to exclude anyone who's made a purchase or has an item in their cart. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, discount incentive. Yep. A delay. One day. Cool. This is great. Mm -hmm. This is fantastic. Yeah, I like that. And I love the screenshot. I think in general, what this article does a really good job of too is using the screenshots to support what it is that they're talking about. Um, I know that Aaron has always been really good at this as a whole, but I know he coaches the people uh, that he works with quite a bit too, to make sure that the images are doing something that the text cannot, and the text does yeah. something that the images cannot. And that's not seen nearly enough. Um, that's a totally. very difficult thing to balance. So uh, remember that SMS is not a standalone channel, and yet it does come with its own strategic value. Treat it as such. Avoid creating text message versions of your email marketing campaigns? Mm. I, I feel like there's a sentence 
missing there? Well, it's not telling me why. Right. So, you know, I I, I want to ra- I just want to wrap this whole thing in a comment and write why. Go ahead. You know, I mean, because you're telling me first of all, you're using the word remember, which is going to make me think immediately. When did we talk about this before? Mm. So I I I tend to cut this word because in in effect, it's making me try to remember something. And now that I'm thinking about it, have we ta- have we talked about this yet? Right. Um, so that's one of those little points of friction that I would just always encourage people to not do to the reader. Just keep me where I am and then move me along. Um, so I would probably cut this and I would just say something like, you know, the thing is, or uh it's key to it's key or some whatever whatever transition you want to use here but like it's the point is that it's not a standalone channel um even though it comes with its own strategic value so uh avoid creating text message versions of your email marketing campaigns because whatever um and then final sentence take away to bring it all in yeah it's probably how i would edit that yeah I would, I would, I mean, it's, it's a lot of the same messaging that we have too of like, um, you know, your, your Twitter posts aren't the same as your LinkedIn posts, right? <laughs> Can we say something where it's like, they, they're, they're actually, do you want to create, like create text message versions of your email marketing campaigns? Because like, do we want to avoid that? Or do we want to like, is your, are the campaigns going to be similar? Right? Yeah. Like, hold on. Hold on. Now I'm looking at this and I'm seeing this a little bit differently. SMS okay. isn't a standalone channel. Avoid creating text message versions of your email marketing campaigns. But if it's not a standalone channel, then why wouldn't you have them be informed by each other? Right. See what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm, con- I'm a little bit confused by the whole thing. Yeah. I don't know what, what he's trying to say here. Right. So that's something where I would I would want to just investigate this a little bit more because those, right, those two things like if it's not a standalone channel, if it is a standalone channel, then run your own separate campaigns entirely. If it's not a standalone channel, then you want to have one be informed by the other, but reinforce each other, um, right, without being a direct copy and paste because obviously you can't uh, offer buy yeah. seal the mm-hmm. deal with card abandonment. Um, I might rephrase this just based on what these. Um, these sections are or like what the common is is like not and seal the deal but experiment right mm-hmm. experiment closing with card abandonment or something that's a little bit um something that's a little bit more along those lines yeah but how do you feel about ellipses i abuse ellipses yeah in my own writing yeah Okay. Yeah, you'll see what I'm you'll see what I'm talking about later on. I'm <laughs> I trail off so often. How do you feel about ellipses? I I go more with the dash, with the M dash than than ellipses. We can't be friends. But I know, I'm sorry. We're done. No more. <laughs> End of stream. No, I like the M dash too. But yeah. I I tend to I tend to use the M dash in a way that like separates or like as like well i used to abuse parentheticals way more yeah so like it's yeah anyways yeah anyway (laughs) (laughs) uh yeah that's all i would do with this is instead of seal the deal i would look at this and say like can we talk about experimenting um because it's a great low risk way to experiment yeah uh we've got big m dash fan and ryan says both are critical to be honest um yeah i don't think i've ever worked with a with a client that allows ellipses now that i'm thinking about it really yeah i guess we just had some anti-ellipses people Hmm. over at grizzle but uh hmm yeah hmm (laughs) it's right (laughs) all right here we go so stage two now we're in the stage two now we've set our foundation wait hang on a second hang on a second okay there's a screenshot here. 
So figure out what motivates them to buy. Balance with what works for your business and you'll know exactly what deals to offer during BCFM. Is this just meant to show an example? I feel like I'm nitpicking, but I would move the screenshot above this paragraph and then this is your beautiful takeaway. Okay. But I'm, I'm nitpicking. No, I think that's, I mean, that's what we're here for, right? Yeah. That's what the people paid to see. <laughs> Sorry, folks, this is not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so stage two before, and yes, yeah, somebody said, uh, can we take a second to appreciate how beautiful the graphics are? Yes, they do. Oh my God, they're stunning. A fantastic job. Octavia says, ellipses have feelings too. <laughs> <laughs> the whole chat right now, you can't see it, but the whole chat right now is I know, I feel a bit left out. The, how many people are here? Uh, we have tuned in live at the moment. We've got 24 people joining in live. Oh so, my God. Yeah. So. Hi, everyone. I have no idea. I, it's just me and Tommy over on my screen. Yeah, Erica can't see what's going on broadcast, folks. So uh, if you want to say stuff that she uh, can't see, then go ahead. Um, she won't know until much later. <laughs> I won't tell her. No, I'm just playing. All right, cool. Uh, all right, so moving forward. Stage two. So again, I really love the structure of this. Stage, stage one, we've got all of that stuff. Now stage two, before Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So we had pre- Pre stuff. Now we've got before Black Friday, so like we're coming up to it, November sixth to cool. November twenty third. This is where we are now. You are here. Um, you've set your foundation. Subscription and checkout pop ups are live. You've created a welcome flow and unleashed abandoned cart automations. What's next? It's time to expand other list growth methods while uh, focusing on pre holiday promotions. This does two things: one, it tests the potential offsite list growth; two. Uh, it tests the audience engagement with tactical campaigns and incentives. That's all all that delicious data in preparation to crush Black Friday, Cyber Monday. I have to say, I love this. I don't think I would change much of anything here. Mm -mm. Am I crazy or does it sound like a different writer? And, and, and here's why I'm saying that. Because there's absolutely nothing about this that is using like negatives or making me feel like agitated or I need to do something immediately. And I do wonder when this was posted, if it was really meant to make you feel like the urgency in, in, in step one mm. or stage one, or if this is a case of warm up itis, as I like to say, where, um, and this happens all the time. It's fascinating as an editor, you get into the meat of the draft and suddenly it's flowing. It's it sounds like really good. You're, you're you've got less edits to make, and you're like, okay, the writer the writer warmed up, and you can you can literally feel the difference. Mm. And so, I, I always encourage people, or or I did a lot when I was at Grizzle, um, go back and with even more of a keen eye than the rest of the piece, look at your introduction and H your first H two and make sure it sounds like the rest of the draft because warm up itis is real and it happens to all of us. Um, and it's amazing how much time as an editor you spend in the first 30% of a draft and then you kind of like, you're like, okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, so just a, a little quick tip there for me. It's funny you say the first 30% of the draft and the warm up because the draft itself is 3,500 words right? 3,500 word plus words. And we're yeah. uh, at 1,132 words uh, at the moment. There you go. So there you go. Yeah. First, first third of the draft. Um, there you go. It's really good. An thing. editor's worst nightmare. The first third of the draft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I agree though. It does. It starts to feel like, okay, now we've got the foundation. Now we're going to groove like, yeah. And here we go. Right. And I feel like a lot of the stuff we've been talking about now, it's going to start you know. Well, let's see, but I bet you, Yeah. I bet you it reads better. All right. Build your list with a pre-holiday incentive. Time, 30 minutes. Okay, so we're back. We're still sticking with the, like, here's how long things are going to get. Most shoppers mm -hmm. won't buy into the lead-up to the holidays. They know discounts are coming. What do you do? You hint at your sale, amping up intrigue and mystery. Or you go the opposite direction and tell them exactly what the promotion is going to be. Plus, you drive home that the best of the best will go fast. In short, get your window shopper sales juices going. Ew. 
<laughs> I just hate the word juices in general. Um, yeah, sales... it's, not, it's not a great, yeah. Yeah. Get, get your window shopper sales juices going by previewing your deal in your welcome pop-up. Yeah, focus on building anticipation and stress clearly that they should sign up to be the first to know as well as get SMS exclusives no one else will have access to. My only little nitpick here, and I do this to everybody, is that and usually I'm not that much of a stickler, but like and in this case is not the start of a sentence. Okay. Yeah, it's, I agree. You can totally use conjunctions, but here it doesn't make sense. Yeah. That's just, yeah. Um, yeah. But my, I, my I high, love My this. high school English teacher yeah. would be proud of me on that one. <laughs> but generally speaking, um, yeah, I feel like there's nothing really wrong with this. See? Yeah. Warm up itis. All right. Biggest sale of the year. We've got, you know, I, again, I like this, the preview. Uh, get early SMS access. The visuals clearly supporting whatever it is that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. This is where I start to feel a little, eh, um, because now we've got our third call out here. Mm -hmm. Right. And as we start to get a little bit deeper into the piece, we're starting to see, we're going to see more of these um, where they're like asides. Do, tell me how you feel about this, right? Because they do a really good job. Aaron is in any publication he's ever run has done a really good job at over delivering on the value that each piece brings. Mm -hmm. Is there a potential or is there a way to over over deliver on the value? I mean, yeah, you can overwhelm people for sure. Like it's, it's always a balance. If you give people too much to do, then sometimes they just won't do it. It's it's similar with um, with courses, right? Like if you kind of smush everything in the world in there, it can feel like, yes, this is the best investment ever. And then you, you start to get into it and you're overwhelmed. And instead of helping you solve one problem, it helps you solve 10 problems. Um, but you really are only mentally able to solve one problem. So you just kind of abandon it and you're like, I'll get back to that course eventually. You know you have it, but do you go through it? Yeah. Right. Um, so I think the same thing applies to to this as well. Um, bonuses are nice. Like it's it's just a balance. If it takes me out of the flow, so like this is a this is a really long call out, right? Um, I you know I personally as as we've been doing this, I've been skipping them yeah. because I'm not really in the mood. Like I'm I'm in the article, so it could be one of those things where you you have like a very sh short, like a much shorter call out box and it's just like bonus. And then you could have like a parenthetical that says like a full list of bonuses will be at the bottom or something. I like so that. So that I read the whole thing and then I get to the bottom. I'm like, oh, there's even more cool, you know? But I don't know, I've never, I've never encountered actually, to be honest, quite, quite this long of a call out. Um, it's a bit distracting for me personally. Huh. Huh. All right. I was just informed that somebody was waiting. Aaron was actually waiting to come into Riverside, but we didn't get the notification, so he wasn't able to be let in. That makes oh, me no. sad. Um, okay, so entice email subscribers via a landing page. Time, 10 minutes each. Odds are, mm -hmm. if you're already sitting on a decent email subscriber base, well, it's time to get them over to SMS. Why? Because SMS is so direct. Customers are, okay, yeah. This is starting to feel. I mean, I'm thankful, I guess, as the reader that you've got, you, you, you believe in me that I've got a good email list, but like, what if I don't? Right. <laughs> like, that's going to make me feel like shit as well. Um, so again, it's one of those things where you kind of have to um, understand that you've got multiple types of readers here, likely. Mm. Um so, you know, if you're speaking to a bunch of really popular companies that you know have this, then cool, say it. Otherwise, I would I would just say, I would take out the odds are, right? Because that's an implication. And I would yeah. just say, if you're sitting on a decent email subscriber base, um, move them over, you know, it's important to move them over to SMS or consider moving them to SMS or you're going to want to move them to SMS. Like how, whatever type of tone you want to take there. Right. Because, um, but then because SMS is so direct text marketing helps you, 
you didn't tell me why I should move them to SMS. You just, you kind of like skipped that and then told me, you told me to move them over, but then you're like, well, actually they don't, they might not opt in. Is that, it's, are you getting that? It's a bit confusing. That's, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little confused by it. Um, Cause it's time to get them over to SMS. Why? Because SMS is so direct and customers are picky about what they opt into. Text marketing helps your business stand out in a sea of holiday email spam. Okay. Yeah. I mean, okay. I, I, I would say, okay, get the, get your, get your email, email subscribers over to SMS. You could shorten that whole thing up. Yeah. Get your email, get to increase your odds of them seeing your message. Yeah. That's it. You double your chances of someone seeing your message. If they don't see it over email, they're going to see a version of it. Uh, totally. Over S over SMS. But, but only if going back up here for a second, only if the two messages are informed by each other, not avoiding <laughs> creating text message versions of the email marketing campaigns. <laughs> you can't get over that sentence. I huh? can't. I can't because <laughs> it's, it, I mean, it's, it's <clears throat> contradictory. It, it contradicts itself in that mm -hmm. sentence. And then it also contradicts the advice that's going up here. No, one needs to be informed by the other. Uh, I'm dying yes, on that hill. Totally. I hope Aaron's totally. still watching this. Um, but yeah, I think this whole, this whole paragraph, this whole opening is, is, is a case of just, just say what you mean, like be a lot clearer and more direct. Yeah. Um, because this is just, it's way too long winded of a way of saying you should, you should hit them in, in both spots if you can, you know, mm. and here, and, and here's how the best, here's the best way to entice them from, from one to the other, like, boom, it's, it's gotta be just much snappier. Um, it, it, yeah, for sure. Also, a, a sea of holiday email spam. Um, Help your business stand out in a sea of sameness. Uh, <laughs> a sea of sameness. Sea of anything. A sea of anything. We're all just in the sea <laughs> in, in marketing, just floating about. <laughs> I've, I've got many, many, many seas that we could be, yes. Um, all right. On your landing page, consider featuring dates and times of the event, discounts or incentives to expect. Products and bundles that will be on sale. Wishlist item. Yep. Checks out. Totally. I mm -hmm. dig it. Uh, send an early bird offer to eager shoppers. Okay. Some shoppers are happy with smaller discounts that they can get before the Black Friday rush. Capture these sales uh, with an offer in November, at least a week before the big weekend. Ideally between the 13th and the 15th. Cool. I actually really like, generally I would say I don't like the prescriptiveness of mm -hmm. things, but this is actually since it's talking about a very specific time frame. Yeah between the 13th and the 15th. Perfect. I'm so curious. Like, I'm so, so curious as we're reading this, like, where is, where is, um, this company's data in this draft? Mm. Like, are you, are you wondering that too? Like, I, I just, I mean, now that I you feel mention like, it, I just feel like there's up, there's, there's so many opportunities in here to be like, you know, most of our, most of our customers get a lift on this day or like last year, you know, this customer, customer X, mm. saw like a like a X percent lift between the 13th and the 15th. Like, I just just think there's opportunities there um, because not only does that back up what you're saying a bit, but it makes me wonder, like, huh, you know, what is this company and should I be using them too? There's just little ways to get your product in here. Yeah, I like that. That's not the 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 call out right in the middle. Yeah, right? keep, exactly. That keeps interrupting the flow. No, I think that's a great that's a great point. Um, on that note, too, uh, Ryan says a good example of a banger extended callouts is Benjamin Elias's pillar content at Active Campaign. Eat before it was cool. Yes, Benjamin does a fantastic job at all of the things. Actually, um, yeah, cool. Ryan, can you um, can you text me that, please? Since you have my number, thank you. <laughs> all right, uh, capture these sales. Some shoppers are yep. These campaigns are also a great way to test engagement and segment your audience, which means campaign personalization, which means one and a half to two and a half more sales. What you were just saying. Yeah. Where's the, where's the, where's all this data one? coming from? I just, I mean, talk about like, just, just, just product marketing, you know, like just, just do it. You it's, know? A, it's a good I'm, setup. <laughs> it's a really it. good you're setup. You're setting yourself up and you're not hitting it home. God, I just made a baseball reference, but um, <laughs> sports. I don't even like. I don't even like that sport. Sports. All the sports. Sports balls. Yeah, um, sports balls. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, use AI SMS to make this process faster and more efficient. Automating segmentation, optimizing send times, and transforming single campaigns into a into multiple texts in just a few clicks. Cool. <clears throat> I'm gonna just I'm gonna nitpick at that. I would change this from the present continuous to the simple present tense. So remove the gerund, which is the ing, and just make this more direct. So use AI SMS to make this process faster and more efficient. Like this will automate segmentation, optimize send times, and transform a single campaign into multiple texts with just a few clicks, like something like that. Because um, this to me re reads a bit passive. Mm. But again, I'm nitpicking. Whenever there's a chance, I always change things to the simple present tense because that's the direct tense. It feels more active. It feels like, yes, we'll do this now instead of like, right. yeah, we'll do it. Yeah. Right. That's a vibe. It's good. It is a vibe. Yeah. All right. Stage three. Uh, I'm going to let folks also, if you want to join into the article now, I can do it without messing all sorts of other stuff up, apparently. Now you can hop into the article here and, uh, and follow along if you'd like. Two days of Black Friday, stage three, during Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Two days of Black Friday, Cyber Monday does not equal two campaigns. As you've seen above, this period is basically a season in itself. What's more, Friday and Monday are just the tippy top of the Revenant Hill climb. <laughs> I like that. It's cute. Warm-ups mm -hmm. that run weeks or days before tend to be more generic. When the main event descends, shoot straight. Clear beats clever. Buy this product at this price for this limited time period. Any notes? I don't have anything. Mm, no, it's pretty good. I'm really enjoying like the the cheekiness yeah. of it all. Yeah. I think if we go back into the warm up itis part, mm -hmm. I think now that we have this, if you can tone it back a little bit earlier to keep that same, same level of cheekiness. Totally. Um, and not like, ah, you missed out and suck. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, open early with SMS exclusive. Uh, get your audience excited with early access test mar text marketing campaign. These not so sneaky promotions are showstoppers. The day before Black Friday has people ready to buy and anxiously waiting for the clock to strike. That's where you come in with a pre madness, highly exclusive drop. Okay. Mm -hmm. I dig it. I dig it. It yeah. can even be as big as a big and exciting as your Black Friday deals because you want people to shop right away. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then we've got another uh, another interstitial here. Mm -hmm. Cool. Launch your Black Friday offer. Campaign one starts. The moment your deal kicks off, your text should hit. As long as you respect legally required quiet hours, but don't expect to be only message uh, but don't expect to be the only message your customers receive. How do you stand out? Wait, are there, there's a thing, there's a legally required quiet hour thing with SMS? Yes, there is. Fascinating. Yes, there is. Uh, this is uh, an example. I wouldn't want to break up the flow of this yeah. at all, but I definitely would want to link to this mm -hmm. uh, of what those legally required quiet hours are. Um, totally. And... I would also be curious to know how gated that is. Um, oh, Ryan's actually coming on here. All right. Nice. Ryan. What's up? Ryan, Wait. you are now on the show. <laughs> oh, it's, there's, it's behind on YouTube. I was like, yeah. <laughs> here, let me pause. Yeah, that's a, uh, there's a, there's a. All right, I'm here. Hi, Ryan. What's up? Um, so I, I wanted to jump in because I had a question for y'all. Um, Erica said Jaren. I've heard the word, obviously, but I did Google it. Um, and it reminded me of a conversation I was having a few days ago with someone about how like when I'm editing, it's like honestly a lot of vibes and a lot less like understanding exactly which grammar rule is being broken. I just know it's wrong and needs to be fixed and I know how to fix it. And when I've had like an editor like y'all come after me, they're like, yeah, you fixed the right things, but it, I don't really know what to call them. And so I'm curious, like, if you feel it's important to be able to give the terminology like that to the writer, or if it's enough to just kind of like explain your thinking in as much plain English as possible, or like sometimes is it okay to just be like this, doesn't sound right to me and now it does 
Okay, so I don't think it matters at all. Um, yeah. The only reason why I use the right words, it's in some cases and certainly not all, um, mm -hmm. is because I went to Thailand and had to relearn grammar as an adult, and then I taught it to five to ten year olds. So I learned, I relearned words like gerund and like these are the three, you know, types of tenses that we have in the English language. But like, again, I will emphasize up until ten years old. I didn't do high school, so. You know, there's 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 certainly parts of grammar that I that I just have a vibe with and I cannot explain. I think it probably makes it more confusing to try to explain it. So I would actually veer towards not explaining it. The one thing that I always do explain is the simple present tense because um, mm -hmm. I I do think that that is one worth understanding since if you Google the simple present tense, you will see that the purpose of that tense is, is literally, or just the present tense in general, it's literally the direct tense. Um, yeah. And so if you understand that, then I think as a writer, if I'm explaining that to you and I'm working with you frequently and I keep saying it, then you'll, you'll understand it. Sometimes I've had writers that I've worked with over a year be like, I still don't really get why this matters. Like, what, what, why is this your change? And so that's why sometimes I just go really hard on, on the ones that I assume I'll get a question back on, where it's like, it's not just me. Like, this is, this is the reason why this tense was invented. Um, but other times I think, no, it's super, it can be super confusing. And it's, if you have the vibe and it's the right move, like, that's way more important than being able to put the word behind it, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I feel like I would rather someone be able to understand the natural flow of the writing and write something that feels natural versus like i've definitely seen like the ex-academic content marketers who do a lot of things right that we don't do to be clear not ragging on them but you know everything is perfectly grammatically correct and reads like chat gpt wrote it because yeah. it is stiff and it doesn't really flow so that that's interesting and i also have a few that like i know to call out by name passive active voice comes mm -hmm. to mind immediately I think most of the things that I would like call out by name with like the actual term fall into the Venn diagram of like important and frequently mistaken or misused because it's like, okay, you need to probably go read like an article about this and why it matters if you're going to keep. Totally. I don't know if he's still here. He looks frozen to me. He does look frozen. To I me can see Tommy. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Oh, am I the one that's frozen? Yeah, you froze for a second. Yeah. <laughs> Oof, thank God for Riverside. The replay will be all good. <laughs> I will also say, Ryan, I um, not only did I have to relearn some of these basics when I went to Thailand, but also when I was at Grizzle, we made an internal course um, uh -huh. all about editing. And so I went even deeper then and like retaught myself even more stuff that I can't even tell you now because that's how quickly I forgot it. But like some of it, I kind of brought back to the forefront of my mind. Does it help me become a better, better editor? No, I don't think mm -hmm. so. But um, it is nice to have in your back pocket, at least documented somewhere where it's like, okay, this is why. Um, yeah, totally. And that's honestly something I think is like a really interesting um, application for AI especially with tools like Grammarly Business. Like I had a hand in writing our style guide at Gorgeous and I definitely broke it by accident at least once in everything that I wrote <laughs> just because you have like a 30, 30 checklist, you know, list of things to look out for. You're just not going to like realistically go through the entire article for each of the 30 every time. Um, but yeah. Froze again, Ryan. Yeah. Froze again, Ryan. There You're we back. go. You're back. Okay. Um, yeah, I think like in general, the writer or uh, Grammarly, any of those tools that like do the style guide check, it's super interesting because you can do the thinking up front and still miss things. And that helps you not miss things. Mm -hmm. And then there's like a whole conversation around when you should ignore Grammarly, which to me is like at least once per article. <laughs> and uh, Fio... Dr. Fio was talking about it on LinkedIn today. It's like almost like a point of pride when you get to the point where you're like, I know more than you to Grammarly. 
Uh, Grammarly tries to make me sound like not sarcastic, and I'm like, Grammarly, I am trying to be sarcastic. Excuse me. Yeah, I, I had a boss at my last job that was really anti Grammarly because he was like, it's not like to write well, you have to ignore it all. consciously breaking these okay. rules am i back yep. yeah you're back oh my god spectrum um i i feel like even when grammarly is only like half right i'm or like half what i want it to say not wrong but just like different i'm okay because i'm making those decisions consciously like i'd rather do that than not have the little maybe there's situations where you would want to turn it off for flow but like i think in general it's pretty helpful to remind yourself like i'm consciously breaking this rule Totally. I never have it on when I'm writing. I never have it on when I'm mm. doing my first edit. And then I turn it on personally. That's so simple and so smart because like I try not to edit as I write, but I do sometimes have Grammarly on during that stage. And like, for what? That's, that's a hot tip. You're welcome. That's why I'm here. I dig it. All right. I'll, I'll leave on that note. I'll pop back in in a little bit, but I was curious. Or Tommy, if you have any thoughts on like, the grammatical language of editing. Oh man, I'm the worst. I'm the worst grammatical e editor <laughs> ever. Yeah. Um. So yeah, no. I yeah. I am right. I am terrible with gra grammar. So, not the person. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. All right. Thank you for hopping See on. Ya. Man. That's a good, good, good. Um. We won't talk about that nearly enough, I think. Your microphone got a bit quiet again, Tommy. Did from you? Oh no, you're back. You're back. Yeah, you're back. okay. I was just yeah. looking away. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. What don't we talk about enough? Just, Grammar? Yeah. We all talk about be like be conversational, be conversational. But no, I think there's definitely something something to that. <clears throat> well, it's gonna be part of whatever next product I put out because <laughs> I love talking about it. I'm so dorky. Naveen says, uh, Erica will teach you. Yes, yes, actually. I will teach you the Erica way, yes. But only up until um, five to 10 year old level. Like I yeah. said, I, I'm not gonna, I do not wanna compete with high school grammar teachers, please. I don't need that pressure in my life. Yeah, no, I mean, as they say though, it was like you write for, you know, write for a fifth grade audience, right? So the best- Yeah, perfect. That's, I'll just stay there in my lane. I think you're doing all right. I think, I think that's <laughs> doing okay. All right, yeah. Uh, and Sabrina says, yeah, I think it's helpful to know grammar rules so you can be intentional when you're breaking them. Absolutely. Just There's nothing better than knowing a rule and being like, get out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. All right. Uh, let's see. Do you want to continue with this piece? Uh, I think, I mean, I feel like it's in a pretty good spot. Yeah, no, I think we're, we've gotten over the warm-up itis, which we should totally coin. Um and I think it's probably going to be similar. So yeah, let's move on to another one, I would say. All right, cool. Um, we are going to move on to Naveen. Actually, no, we're going to move. Naveen will come uh, after Ankit. We're going to have Ankit. Um, so we're going to do the 10 best AI tools for reaching your sales goals. Cool. I will put this into the chat here, folks, so you can play along. Ankit, if you are watching hi i just see tripti uh join in here uh so i will also let me just pull up the link again so if you would like to come on to the call you can join us there we go and we will go from here. Okay, so we've got the 10 best tools. So Ankit, by the way, is a freelance B2B SaaS writer, WordPress, HubSpot, Buffer, Zapier, and more. With over seven years of SEO and content marketing experience, he's a gamer during the day and a writer at night because opposite time zones are a thing. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great I bio. It. I love it. Um, okay, so the 10 best AI tools for reaching your sales goals. I know you had a chance to take a look at this. Uh, a little bit early, uh, I did as well. What were your initial thoughts just on your skim through? Um, I only skimmed the introduction okay. to be honest. So I'll start with that. I'll let you take the, the overall skim through if you had a chance. Okay, cool. Um, so my overall thought of the introduction 
is that it is really good, but this first sentence gets me a bit. Okay. Um, and again, I don't know if it's because I've read a thousand of them and how I would feel if I'd never read this before. But I feel like if the article is the 10 best AI tools for reaching your sales goals, I'm probably clicking on that because I have an idea that there's a million AI tools out there, right? Like I know that and I just want the 10 best ones. So reminding me that there are hundreds out there and that it's hard to pick the right ones and it's confusing and daunting is telling me what I already know, right? And so a lot of the time we do this because it's a good way to warm up. But again, 99.999% of the time, you don't need the sentence if the right. intent is there. Um, so I mean, I'm here because I like the title. Like I wanna learn more. Just, just get me into it, like help me please honestly, because there are millions of AI tools out there. Just tell me, please. I'm, I'm here. I am at your beck and call. Um, so I just think it's wasted real estate, right? Like you've only got a few sentences to make people decide if they want to stay or go. Um, so I would say something in the introduction instead um, about, you know, like, again, like the second line. So we've handpicked the top 10 AI tools for sales teams, but that sort of mirrors the title. So uh, to me, that's probably a keyword if I had to guess. So I understand the point of saying that up top, I guess, for SEO purposes. But um, I would, I, I want to know, um, like, why these ten specifically? That mm. would probably be more interesting to me here. Like, out of the hundreds of you know choices for sales teams to use AI to something right like yep. what's the problem what's the like like pull me in emotionally like speak to why i'm here right because you should know why i'm here if you're writing this I, like so out of all of them like we've picked these 10 to help you solve problem um these 10 are great for you know outcome 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 um so now i'm like shit okay this guy gets me he knows why i'm here um now not only going to help you do that, I'm going to like pair that with some best practices so you don't waste your time like messing about with them. Uh, but first, yeah, let's like let's understand how in general like you can use AI um, in 2023, like how sales teams use AI. Again, like this is one of those things where I, I I would need I would need a brief, right? Like I would need to know why this was chosen to be included because mm -hmm. I. I think with intent, I don't need to know how sales teams use AI. It just needs to answer the question. Right. So there's a part of me as the developmental editor that would want to check the brief here and the strategy and be like, why is this how sales teams use AI part of the 10 best AI tools? Mm. Should I just get to the 10 best AI tools? And if so, uh, if there is a point of this, and this is part of what other articles are talking about and our, our audience has a need for it and blah, blah, blah. Should I take all of this, which is the first couple pages, and put it after the tools? Like, should I just give you what you need and then tell you, you know, here's how sales sales teams are best using this in case you want to know more? Mm. So that's a developmental thought as I read that. Uh, Zachary actually asks, going off your feedback on the intro sentence, where do you think the balance is between not telling the readers what they know, but also empathizing with them? <laughs> I have some thoughts on that, if you don't mind me. Go for in it. So, Please do, yes. So in my most recent uh, email series of uh, wants versus needs and bright, better endings <coughs> and whatnot, um, there is the way that we can empathize with folks. It, I, a lot of the way that we think about empathizing with our reader is to say their situation and report their situation back to them. And that's to say, we know what you're going through because this is what we think you, this is what, what it is. That's not empathy. Um, empathy is, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Um, so here's an example. Uh, the article is on productivity and it's every day entrepreneurs feel like they're overwhelmed with so many different things that they need to do. There are always things that need to be happening emails are catching on fire and the your child is in the trash can and you have a meeting coming up in the next five minutes and uh you have too much that you need to get done right let's talk about 
five ways that you can be more productive uh, or to five ways to increase your efficiency and be more productive. Okay, cool. You're telling me what my day is like. Okay. Now here's another example of this. Imagine this. It's you've got five emails that need to be sent. You've got, um, I had a real, I, I wrote this out. It was a really great example when I wrote it out, but it was to the degree of, it's this emotional storytelling aspect of it where it's, uh, Erica, I'm trying to say something and then I totally, I had this whole train. Why of don't thought. you bring up your, why don't you bring up the email? I, I just read this the other day. Oh man. Why don't I bring it up? Yeah, you bring it up. If I bring it up, it's going to break all the screen. Um, I, I wrote okay, about it on, on a LinkedIn second. a little while ago. Um, but the idea. Do you, remember, do you remember the title of the email? No, it was a LinkedIn message. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a while ago. But the idea is um, you can tell people what it is that their scenario or you can empathize by role playing that scenario out. Right. There's. You know, you've got five email, you've got five messages in your inbox. You've got deadlines that were due yesterday. Welcome to nine o'clock in the morning. Um, and yep. it's Monday morning and you've already, you're already behind. What you can do is, you know, we talk about storytelling, storytelling, storytelling. And the empathy part comes from uh, not telling the story. It's about bringing that person into the story if that makes sense erica do you, do you get what i'm going at here totally i've got your um your introduction email open and you called it uh energetic charges yes so i totally understand what you're saying okay. so it's a it's a matter of telling someone okay you know um new, it, you 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 um have neutrality versus energetic charges right. so it's not um, it's not necessarily empathetic because it's a bit neutral. It's sort of it's sort of the state of play, right? There, you're you're describing um, what my life is like every day, and you're not necessarily making me feel anything except maybe a bit of anxiety because like shit, my life is intense and I'm not getting anything done. But um, in, if you start with a bit of an energetic charge of you've missed the deadline, you're late to the meeting, and that time sensitive email is nowhere to be found, like that's what you wrote here in your email. Welcome to 9 a.m. Monday morning. That is more of starting right in the middle of the story and making leading with emotion rather than leading with this kind of neutral state of play. Um, so it's a subtle difference, but it's a difference enough to um, make me feel connected to what you're saying um, in a good way, whether, whether that makes me feel, um, you know, like, huh, you know, whatever it is, um, versus just kind of stating what my life is like and making me like kind of look at it from the outside and being like, oh, yeah, you know, shit. Yeah, I, that's that's really it. It's it's matching the energy of the, yeah. the, where the person's at rather than telling them where the person's at. Right. Right. Um, so in this case, something like with hundreds of AI sales tools in the market, uh, picking the right ones for your tech stack can be confusing and daunting. How is it confusing, though? Like, what does it feel like to be confused in this <clears throat> scenario? Um, and then to help me out, cool. You've handpicked the 10 AI tools for sales teams. That's awesome. I would want to know what that confusion is though. Like what is the confusion? What is the dauntingness of it? Um, AI is a big blanket term that's being used by a lot of different people right now. So what does that, how do you draw that out? How do you draw the confusion out? Um, and I think what you were saying there, Erica was, was really great where it's like signpost a little bit about what the categories of things are that we're talking about at the very least. Um, so we have a very strong idea of what's going on. Uh, Naveen says, uh, this is where Tommy needs warmups. Me talking about <laughs> what we were talking about here. Um, warm up at us yeah. every time. Zachary, does that make sense though? Um, finding that balance between telling readers what they know and also empathizing with them. Like the empathy comes from the writing itself and about what that writing makes the person feel rather than telling them that situation. Right. Uh, okay. So with hundreds of AI sales tools in the market, picking the right ones. Yeah. With this, I would look at this and go like, I would, I would open this with the idea that 
Uh, AI is a big blanket term right now. It's a buzzword. There are ways that it can be used, but even how do I, like, we've got the top 10 best AI tools for reaching your sales goals. What, can we define what a sales goal is? Can mm -hmm. we, like, what are the different ways that we can look at that? Um, and then this actually, this next part here, right? Um, how sales teams use AI. As part of our State of AI 2023 report, uh, we surveyed over 1,350 professionals across different business departments. Um, we found that this is something we were actually talking about in the last edit where um, I feel like I'm being thrown a lot of stats all at once. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a lot of, there's not a lot that's making me connect to what these stats are. Totally. I think this is an example of where storytelling or even just anecdotal insights would add a lot to this. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> if I'm a salesperson and I see these stats, I'm looking at them and logically I'm thinking, cool, like that makes sense. That resonates a bit. But am I feeling anything? Right. Not really. Right. Not really, because, you know, you're telling me something that I already know or one of these things surprises me. But because there's no story. Um, I'm, I'm sort of just kind of looking at it like, okay, right? Rather than feeling like totally drawn into it. So again, I think if the intro kind of led with um, speaking more to the problems that these tools help you solve um, and more of the outcomes that I could get from them and then um, maybe wrapping these, these stats in any type of a story um, where, you know, like we, we, um, we surveyed 1350 professionals, most of them are working um, in this type of environment to, you know, try to solve this type of thing. They struggle with this type of thing. Um, a lot of them spent, spend a lot of their day talking to this type of person. Um, so it turns out that when they, when they, the 35% of them automate manual tasks, it helps them, gives them more time to do this, this, and that. Like, interestingly, you know, this, this, we spoke to this specific person or like, here's this, what this specific person told us, like qualitatively, um, you know, when they automated tasks, it helped them with this, this, and I don't know something. And I'm sure that you're going to get more into that um, lower down. Right. And I haven't read this specifically, but um, when you just kind of throw data in here like this, it's, it's very difficult to picture it right. in your actual day, solving your actual problems. Um so any type of way, like, I'm curious out of those 1350 professionals, if it was all quantitative data or if there were any open-ended questions, because it would be very interesting to add some of those highlights in. Mm. Yeah, this is a great example of, you know, we can contextualize, like, use the use this data to write a contextualization. Like, what does, what does it feel like for the other... Um, you know, the people who aren't in that 35% to have manual tasks that aren't being used AI, <clears throat> right? Um, right. What's it like for the rest that aren't using AI to offer insights? Like if we want to talk about twisting the knife a little bit or setting setting up that story, right? Then we, we reverse engineer what these stats are to say, okay, what's it like to be that person? What's that trouble look like? How do we then lead into that? And then, um, and then make it feel like, okay, these stats actually mean something, right? Because mm -hmm. chances are likely at this stage in the game, you're not part of that 35%. You're not part of the 34%. You're not part of the 31%. You're actually part of the opposite side. And if you're looking at the top 10 best AI tools to reach your sales goal, you want to be part of this 35, 34, 31%, right? Right. Um, and totally. And if you look under number one, automating manual tasks, it does say... 35% of sales professionals are automating manual tasks, helping them save about two hours and 15 minutes each day on average. So that's a very compelling line. I feel like um, we could dive way deeper into, instead of just saying some of these tasks include data entry, note-taking and scheduling among other things, like that feels like a throwaway line. Right. Whereas like, that's the line, right? Like this whole article is meant to tell me why I need to like what these tools are and how they're going to help me. And if you're just kind of glossing over um, data entry, note taking and scheduling in two hours and 15 minutes, like 
why gloss over it? That's the, that's the meat. Like, that's why I'm here. Right. Yeah. Um, that's the pain. Yeah. That's the intro. Like you, ex- right. you extract the intro from that where it's like, you know, uh, I, I, I think I've written an intro along these lines where it's like, yeah, same actually. You, you spend, you spend all morning, you, you, you sign into the, you log into your computer you schedule a meeting, you schedule another meeting, you listen to the replay of the other person, you take the notes, you, you know, enter the stuff. And now that it's 11 a.m. Monday morning, now you're ready to start actually trying to make sales, right? The idea mm-hmm. would be, um, in this case, like, what's the enemy? Something I try to think about, I've been thinking about a lot more lately as the forces of antagonism. Yeah. I've been digging a lot more into, like, my screenwriting background. Um, and one of the things that, uh, is it for anybody, you've got wants, which are the objective goals that somebody wants to achieve. You've got needs, which are the things that are generally unknown to that person, um, that they, that they, uh, are need to be completely fulfilled. And then what you have are your forces of antagonism, which make it so that person cannot achieve their want, or they have to overcome those obstacles to do that. In this case, data entry, note taking, scheduling, those are obstacles to get past the deal of making more sales, right? So how do we start to twist that? How do we bring in the forces of antagonism early on? And then we can start to use this, back it up. And uh, I think you were saying this a little bit earlier too, is that we actually don't get into tools where do we get into the tools? After after all of this. After all this. So we take 10 best tools and then how many how many words is this? It takes us 595 words to get into the tools. Right. I feel like this should be after the tools okay. or as a link that's like hey, you know, like check out our 2023 state of AI report where we we will show you exactly how 1350 professionals that we surveyed are incorporating AI into their workflows like they're using tools like this and we like dive deep in like give me somewhere else to go and keep me in your in your ecosphere I feel like putting it all together is sort of it, it, it's adding a bit of friction. Like I, I really just want to understand the tools. Mm-hmm. Um, or you can tell me in a call out at the bottom of the intro, like, Hey, I'm about to tell you these 10 tools, but also like, you know, click into this when you're done, because here's like the best way to incorporate them. Like based on our, our survey, like our unique survey, whatever it is. Um, but putting it here at the top is, I think it's just a little bit out of order personally. Yeah. Too much context. Yes, a little bit too much context. All right, so let's see. Let's get into the 10 best AI sales tools for reaching your goals. Um, I would I would like to see probably earlier in here um, the categorization of what these tools are to do mm-hmm. um, because like there are tons of tools now for all sorts of different <clears throat> things. Yep. So what's the categorization? Like what are the categories of tools? Um, and structurally speaking, you could actually do 100 best AI sales tools, right? You don't have to start with, you know, it, with top 10, like, random. You could do 100 if you wanted to. As long mm-hmm. as they're categorized, it helps people to self-select instead of right now we're going to 10 random tools that do something. Yeah, I mean, sales teams have so many needs yeah. for so many different tools and so many workflows, like... Uh, yeah, totally. Uh, help me, help me help myself a bit better here. All right. So HubSpot is number one AI sales tool. This is a HubSpot piece. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know as a casual person, how HubSpot is an AI tool. Okay. Yep. I think, okay. So we've incorporated AI into our platform in a variety of ways. First of all, Our uh, forecasting software helps teams accurately predict uh, future revenue or accurately forecast future revenue and monitor their pipeline. Secondly, let me do this. Mm -hmm. Um, Secondly, predictive lead scoring feature 
helps sales reps identify the highest quality leads in their pipelines by taking thousands of data points and custom scoring criteria as input. Since we've launched our content assistant, uh, our customers haven't been able to stop talking about it. Content assistant, powered by OpenAI's GPT 3.5 model, is a suite of free AI-powered features that help people across different departments ideate, uh, create, and share top-notch quality or content in a flash. Sales teams can use it to create collaterals, craft messages, and emails, fix grammatical errors, and repurpose content, among other things. Erica, where you, where's your head at right now? Um, I just am, you know, it reads like, um, kind of like copy on a sales page rather than, like, I'm just, I'm not really, I'm not really feeling anything, um, if that makes sense. Like, I'm not feeling any emotions. Um, I'm, this feels like a lot of features, mm -hmm. um, a little bit of benefits, but mostly features. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not like necessarily drawn into the words. Um, I'm experiencing a bit of friction where it's like, okay, but what problems are these going to help me solve and why, why should I care? Um, I'm also like, I'm stuck a bit on the first of all and the secondly, when, whenever you, when you use phrases like this, um, because the content assistant is the third, is the thirdly technically, right? <laughs> like it's right. the third of the list. Like no one ever says thirdly. So if you set yourself up for first, second, third, you know, fourth, fifth, like you, you kind of, you have to keep doing it or else you kind of get to the point where it's like, okay, I'm just going to stop saying it like that. And then you lose a bit of cohesion. Um, if you're going to say first of all or second of all they kind of have to you ha you have to then like make a point to like why did you present this first why did you present this second um i feel like that you could have there's just no need for it um like i i so your forecasting software does this okay cool then we just like move right along to something else cool and then i feel like we spend all this time talking about content assistant which so that seems like it's more important maybe um this is still content assistant and then Last but not least, we've got this thing. Um, I feel like there's 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 got to be a way before introducing these where you can, you know, we've incorporated AI into our platform to help you like in a variety of ways. That to me, that's filler. Like, tell me tell me why you've incorporated AI into your platform and what problems it helps people solve. Like, as a theme, mm. right? Um, and then you can, you know, maybe bullet it. Like our forecasting software helps teams this. Our predictive lead scoring helps teams do this. And then like our content assistant is actually like the most impressive, like wrap it in a bit more of like a, like a story. Like we launched it, you know, uh, in whatever time period or, you know, recently we launched it and um, our customers haven't been able to stop talking about it because it's, you know, solving the biggest problem that they have, which is this, like, like bring me more into it, right? Like, like, uh, that sounds that our customers haven't been able to stop talking about it um, is a big statement. Um, so I feel like there's opportunity there to to tell me more about why that is, because it sounds like a very big deal. But instead of like bringing me into that world, it, it kind of then just it just just goes into this huge list. Um, mm. So I, I feel like you can you can bring me more into your world here and make me feel excited about using it by telling me why they haven't been able to stop talking about it thematically here just to set a bit of context before you then list out the things um you know um because it, or it, it's very easy to skim this um rather than become invested in it if that makes sense it does and i think some of that might be symptomatic for the site that it was published on mm -hmm. um of course uh but then the other part of that is i think um yeah, I mean, if we're talking about the 10 best AI tools uh, for reaching sales goals, right, what I'm looking at here is, uh, first of all, our forecasting software helps us. I always try to think of it this way, right, is I'm looking at the subject or the headline and I'm going, okay, reaching sales goals. I try to think about what the promise is that that headline is delivering mm -hmm. and then how does every line or as, as close to every line as possible delivering on that promise that the overall thing is. And what I'm seeing in this, and this is not just this piece, this is so many different pieces, period, mm -hmm. right? 
is what I would want to see out of this is two things. One, HubSpot dash does this thing to reach your sales goals, right? Whatever it is, HubSpot uh, dash helps forecast, predict leads, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, ideates, right? Something totally. like that, right? So then, and then how can I continue to tie that back into reaching sales goals? So if I'm talking about, okay, forecasting software, uh, helps teams accurately forecast future revenue and monitor pipelines. Cool. How does that help me reach my sales goal? Yep. Right. How does predictive lead scoring help me reach my sales goal? And as I'm going to do my next read through, I'm always looking at that, right? How can I constantly yep. try and tie it back there? And even if, and in, in, in that case, even if we're still doing like a, like a features list, um, at least we can start to tie that back to that tangible thing that we're trying to go after. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we've got some people in the in the chat here talking. Yeah, okay. So, all right, so content assistant powered by a chat open AG. Yeah. And to me, knowing that this is from HubSpot too, um, this kind of makes me feel like the rest of it, like we the the whole piece was written to have the section one. Mm-hmm. And then are we gonna like what's the rest of the <clears throat> what's the rest going to look like? How do you feel about companies putting themselves first? Should they put themselves first, middle, last? Does it matter? Uh, I typically I think they need to come wherever they fit into the overall story of what the yeah. piece is supposed to be about. So I don't have any hard and fast rules about that, but like if we're talking about, you know, in, in something like this, right? If we're looking at like best AI tools for reaching sales goals, and one of those things is to do with like prospecting, right? Yeah. I might put prospecting first, and then I might put, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know the entire sales process off the top of my head, but I would start to look at what that journey is that somebody would go through and then where does my tool fit into that journey? Um, totally. Yep. Because I yep. think in a lot of cases, just as readers, um, you know, most of the time I don't even know what website I'm on to be honest with you, but like, I also, yeah. I also know that when I'm on somebody's website, it can feel really self-serving if I see them come first in any list. So, but again, that's editorial policies too. Like sometimes that the writer has nothing to do with that. Totally. All right. So. Oh no, they have no, no, normally they don't. No. <laughs> uh, Naveen says, if you are in marketing, you know that the publishing company is at number one. You almost skip the number one and move to number two and further. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then Ryan says, I usually go first. Uh, it's going to seem self-serving to anyone with discretion, no matter what. Might as well grab any of the folks who click on the first one they see. There's, I mean, yeah. It's one of those things where you just have to test it. Yeah, there's, there's, who knows? there's no way of knowing. Um, yeah. Okay, so Apollo AI. Again, I would want to see out of these subheaders here just what this does if we're talking about the best AI tools for reaching your sales goal. Yep. Right? What does this do? Um, Apollo is a sales intelligence platform with a massive database of over 60 million companies and 260 million contacts. Cool. Sales teams use this platform to not only get their hands on information about potential customers, but also connect with them. Cool. I would actually, this is one of those things where I might put that one first, actually. Um, mm -hmm. In simple terms, Apollo is an end-to-end -end sales platform that helps sales rep find, call, email, and close their ideal customers in one place. Most recently, they've launched their AI assistant called Apollo AI. <coughs> it's powered by OpenAI's GPT model, of course, because they all are. Um, <laughs> and built on Apollo's database of 60 million companies and 260 million contacts. Cool. I like this. I like the what we what we like section uh, mm -hmm. of this. I think my major developmental stuff would be like Drift. I would. I really do want to see like what these tools do. Yeah. In their subhead. Um, I don't know. What do you think about this? No, I I I agree. I think this one is more interesting, which is ironic because. HubSpot is the tool that, you know, like they're the writer. I feel like HubSpot, the HubSpot one tried to shove like a bunch of 
of stuff in here. I just think the HubSpot problem could have been solved with we've incorporated AI into our platform in a variety of ways and then just like set the context before you got into the specific stuff. Whereas that's what they, that's what you've done here, right? We set the context nicely and then we're saying, here's how it, you can use AI with it. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. Um, I also like how you can craft and send hyper-personalized emails to every prospect in your sales pipeline without having to type a single word. Like that's cool. Like there should be sentences like that in almost every line, right? Like yeah. tell me like what I'm going to gain or what problem I'm going to overcome um, rather than just listing um, features, right? Um, so yeah, I think that was a, that was a, a much better section in my opinion. Yeah. And then we've got drift again. And let's just be honest. These are the, these are like, there is not much you can do with these articles to make them super compelling and interesting. Like <laughs> this is just one of those articles where it's like, what are we going to do? You know, like you kind of just have to get to the point, but there are, there are ways that you can make it as interesting as possible. But like, these are not the most interesting, like these top 10 tools are never the most interesting article you're going to read on the internet. You know, they are, I think that the, I, I actually can, I will disagree with you okay. in some regards because it's about how it's framed and it's about the discovery method. Okay. Right. Um, if I were to, <clears throat> I don't know how I would find a tip or an article like this on, I don't know why I would personally click on an article about like top 10 tools to use for AI, but actually, no, that's not true. I just looked at one with um, Zapier recently. They released something on, uh, best ways to incorporate, you know, top 10 integrations you can do with, uh, chat GPT, right? Mm. Something along those lines. And I thought that that was fascinating. Um, okay. and I think the way that it, what I, what I'm interested in when I look at a piece like this, how it can be very interesting is if you can not just talk about them as standalone tools, but how they fit together as part of a full stack. Yes. Right. Okay. So I think that there's definitely. Um, if you're in the market for tools, right, then the question of like, how does this fit into our existing stack and, or how can we build this together as a stack? There is something that can be really interesting about that, but you have to be telling that story even on like, a, if not explicitly, then on a meta level of yeah. like, here are how all these things play together. Totally. I'm looking at, um, I just Googled. I'm looking at the best AI productivity tools in 2023 by Zapier. Yeah. Um, and it, I agree with you. This is an, a, a really good way of doing this. And I love how it starts with how I selected the best AI productivity app in each category. Yeah. Like that's, that's what I was saying earlier at the, at the start of this piece. Like, why did you choose these 10? Like, if anything, that's just a nice way to differentiate from anyone else. Just having that little, like, I'm a person that wrote this, you know, like, I'm not just a faceless brand, like here, like, yeah. or I, or we, like, we chose these because like, we're humans that have tested them, right? Like, it just adds a little bit of personalization to, to an article like this. Can you, um, can you share that in the chat here? And mm -hmm. then I will share that with our uh, lovely audience members here. Mm -hmm. We've got some discussion right now happening yeah, what uh, are we talking about? Over here, and uh, let's say, I'm not just saying pros and cons. Let's see, hold on. Okay, yeah. Ryan says, I also prefer to segment uh, like best for X, best for Y. Rarely is yeah. the best route lumping one through 10, all of them in one list, especially if you're implying a ranking. Um, and then Octavia says, I like adding mine last by that point. I'm working up what the other options are missing. So my solution comes as one that doesn't miss all that. Nope. I've seen people, I've seen people put it last as well for that reason. She asked, am I a horrible writer person? No, you're not. Um, Ryan says, I'm not saying pros, cons, pricing isn't ever the right move for H3s, but I'm trying to avoid it impossible. It feels generic. Yeah. Will mm -hmm. there be a edit, a replay of the editathon available? Yes. And we're going to be also doing, um, uh, clippable moments, nice sections, so we can have the best of moments. Um, large list. Yeah, if it's just the last in a large list, chances are your tool might not be clicked if they choose to get to some other tool above yours. 
Okay, that's an interesting point. Um, yeah, okay. Cool. I just wish companies had like the, like I guess my ideal type of, of way to do it, but I, I already know that companies won't do this. But like if it was me, I'd be like, I'm going first. Cause I love my, I love my tool, you know, like just be honest about right. it. Like I'm, I love my tool. Like this is the first one on the list because it's the first one in my heart. Like say something stupid, right? Like, like, you know, like, but that's just me. I'm also sar just super sarcastic. Well, I was actually, I was just editing a piece. Um, so yeah, I wish that more companies would do that. Just be like, yeah, we're awesome. That's why we're putting ourselves first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was, I was also like, or, or make a joke. Like you're not like, we're not going to make any money if you click on the other ones, but we will make money if you click on ours. <laughs> See, this is why you got to start, start, start your own, your, your new website there, Erica. You got to start doing this for yourself. Um, so, uh, I was actually, I was just editing somebody recently though. And, um, something that made this interesting about what they were doing is I think they were writing for Zapier, but it was like. What Zapier allows their writers to do that a lot of companies don't is to actually put their first person perspective in it, right? And they were doing, it was an evaluation of, I think it was Mon or Trello versus uh, ClickUp was the tool. Mm -hmm. It was at this versus that. And I thought what was really interesting about Zapier allowing their person to um, put themselves in it, it was they said, as a freelancer, I am exposed to these different tools to work with my different clients. Here's why yeah. my perspective on this is qualified. And also it's my perspective, but these are the strengths and weaknesses from what I can see right here, right? Yeah. What I think, and I think this is more of a policy of HubSpot than it is anything else, but what I think this doesn't have and what a lot of tools Roundup's post could have is that perspective of this is why we think these are the best things for these particular things. And if that's totally. something that can be signposted earlier on in the intro, if we're talking about the, um, if we're talking about, you know, the, the, the productivity aspect of it, the writing aspect of it, any of that, if we're, if we're talking about that, and then we're very clearly in the, you know, the tool itself talking about why this is important, <clears throat> then we can reframe a lot of the rest of it. Like a lot of it can just start to feel like, tangible like this is why i'm recommending this tool to you instead of totally this is a tool that's on a list that yeah makes sense it does i mean t i mean that's that's how i would prefer to write everything but i understand as the as as uh someone who comes from from an agency um and i've also freelanced like it's not up to you and to <laughs> convince businesses to let you take the more personalized uh, route is, it's just not easy. Mm. Um, but that's the route that I would argue for. It's a way to, it's, an, it's super easy way to differentiate and it works uh, based on me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, By the way, sorry if you can hear a vacuum, that should be over with soon. But there is a vacuum outside the door. That's quite all right. Um, do you want to let's keep? Do you want to keep going through this piece? Let's keep going through this piece. Yeah. Uh, Drift is an AI-powered conversational platform that helps marketing, sales, and customer service teams deliver personalized customer experiences at scale. This is a very long sentence. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. Long sentences like this. What do you think? How do it's you, just a bit. How do you deal with that? In general, because like, we're trying to fit in like all of the different things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just like, I don't think this part's necessary. Um, oops, suggested mode. Just tell me what it does, you know? Does, does knowing that it's an AI powered conversational platform really help me learn anything? Mm. Um, like it helps marketing sales and customer service teams deliver personalized customer experiences at scale, I think is much more interesting than an AI powered conversational platform, which doesn't mean anything. Right. Um, so start. if I were to keep that sentence, I would remove that. Um, honestly, I'd probably remove the whole first sentence and just get, get into the next one, which is a little bit more specific. Also it's much more specific. It's also quite long though. Drift enables sales teams to jumpstart conversations 
improve sales efficiency and engage target accounts. I mean, you would just, you would want to just end the sentence there and go like this, right? So that would do. Yes. Um, uh, just enable sales teams to jumpstart conversations, improve sales efficiency and engage target accounts provides them with website, visitor analytics, real-time notifications, the ability to initiate conversations with prospects and more. I still don't know what, like, I, like that's just, it's just a lot of, it's just a lot of words. I would want to know more about the personalized customer experiences at scale bit, I guess. Mm. Um, I like the, uh, I like the jumpstart I mean, I, I like all the words in that, but again, they're, they're all kind of like these, these general phrases, even though it's more specific, it's still not very specific. Like, what do you mean by jumpstart mm. conversations? Like in what, in what context, um, improving sales efficiency. I mean, that can mean anything right. depending on the reader, um, and engage target account. I mean. I think there's probably ways to make that a little bit clearer and a little like actually more specific than that. I find myself guilty of this on a pretty regular basis, which is long, like not it, it's multiple commas, right? Mm -hmm. In a nail sales teams to jumpstart conversations, improve sales efficiency and engage target accounts. And well, I'm just going to keep the original sentence there as it provides them with website visitor analytics, real time <clears> notifications <throat> and the ability to initiate conversations via chat bots and more like <laughs> that is a very long sentence. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that there's for, for me, uh, when I go through all of these like multiple things inside um, multiple commas, if you will. Mm -hmm. It's because like, I feel like personally, and I can't speak to Ankit because I know that Ankit's, it's not necessarily the case here, but, um, I know I do that because I'm trying to fit all of the things in that it can do, but I don't also necessarily understand what all of those things are. Um, yeah, totally. And I think with something like this, right, it might be beneficial, um, because we're talking about the 10 best tools for reaching sales goals. Instead of talking about all the things that all of the tools can do, give it like one or two really good things. Talk yeah. about what it's good at and especially the AI part of it because not all of this stuff is all AI related, right? Yep. Um, talk about what those what that AI is good at and then uh, and then move on. If, if, if you're creating a hook on it that's interesting, if the overall idea is to group yourself in with these other tools, but then maybe give people the opportunity to go and click through and say like, hey, we're gonna build our stack base off of this. This isn't the case with HubSpot, but maybe it's the case with somebody who's doing this with like an affiliate list, right? Mm -hmm. um, then take give, the, give yourself the opportunity to like, talk about the one thing that it's really good at, get people interested to go and click through, and then move on, right? Yeah. Um, so for instance, Drift helps you identify which accounts you should prioritize based on collecting buying signals in your context and your tech stack, using the information to calculate the AI. Okay. Like this, Ankit, you have very long sentences here. This is a 32 word sentence. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, why do I care about an AI powered engagement score? You know what I mean? Like little details like that. It feels like a feature thing. Like, cool, right. I'll get an AI powered and get like, what do I like? What does that actually help me achieve? What does um, that do? What does that do? Um, why do I care? I've got a lot of questions as I read through this. Um, like, you can tell me that you can just tell me that it helps me prioritize buying signals from my contacts so that I know which ones to focus on the most. Like, don't tell me that anything about an AI powered engagement score. It's just a fancy word that the company came up with. Like who cares? Right. Right. Um, those things just don't matter in my opinion. They had, they had a bit of friction. So well, I would totally remove that. What does it do? I want to know what yeah. the engagement score does. How do you use it? Right. It just doesn't matter. Right. It doesn't matter right now. 
Right. I'm trying to I'm trying to just learn about a tool that's going to help me reach my sales goal, like on a, at like a very high level. Like I don't need to know the fancy names that they've given their things that are going to help me. Like that's later. Yeah. All right. Last but not least, Drift will notify your sales reps the moment your potential customers land on your website, empowering them to initiate real time conversations with them. This is cool. That's the most interesting thing so far. Don't make that last. Make that first. Yeah. Yeah. Drift notifies your sales reps the moment your potential customers land on your website, empowering them to initiate real-time conversations with them. Okay, now how's the AI-powered engagement score come into play? How does, like, all of that, that's all super cool. Put that first. Totally. Put that first because now we can jumpstart conversations and sales efficiency. I, I don't know. I don't know if I care about improving sales efficiency because we're talking about reaching sales goals. But, like, this, definitely super cool. Uh, notify mm -hmm. sales reps first. Now we have all this other information on them. Presumably, if we're putting, say we're working these two tools together, right? We've got Apollo and here. Now we've got a whole boatload of information on these people. And now I've got AI work putting, you know, helping me reach my sales goals faster. Totally. Right? On top of this, you can connect Drift with your existing tech stack. Cool, because now that means I can incorporate Apollo. Now we're starting to create a through line. All right, what are you thinking, Erica? <laughs> I'm just thinking of a way to incorporate like a like a more emotional kind of anecdote into this or a story. Like you could start right underneath where it says image source, the first sentence, you could start by being like, you know how annoying it is when customers land on your website or like imagine when you when customers land on your, you know, like or like this scenario is typical customers land on your website. And mm. then what happens? nothing <laughs> you know like right. you didn't you didn't talk to them in real time because you couldn't track it well drift has solved that problem like that's cool. i like that i like that you know what i mean and you like can, you can set up each one of these sections with that yeah scenario. like tell me what the scenario is that this has then solved like give me the state of play tell me how this has solved it connect it with ai like that's much more interesting to me um like this just reads like a long, like a long list. It's not making me feel anything. Mm. I like that. So with each section, so if we were to give this a, okay. Cause then we go into like gong and then we've got another big list of features, what we like. Okay, cool. So let's say with this piece, the general piece of feedback would be before it gets sent back to the author is from a structural perspective. Uh, we're looking at a few things. One, set up the scenario. Why we like mm -hmm. the tool. Cool. Um, what the tool does, how it solves, can it integrate with the rest of the stack, right? Yeah. From the structure perspective of how you're putting each of the pieces together, let's talk about order of importance or not order of importance, but order of sales journey where it might fit in. So, you know, beginning part of the sales process all the way down to the end. So we've got the leads database with, uh, one of them before, right? Can we structure yep. it in a way where that all makes sense? And then as we reverse into the intro, can we, and this was something that I'd want to see the, the through line, if we were to keep all of the stats that we were talking about from this, the report that they had, mm -hmm. can we tie each tool to some element of those stats so there's a through line there, but then can we also create a scenario at the very top to frame up everything else that we're going to talk about afterwards? Right. So how yeah. are we saving, you know, uh, how are we being more efficient, uh, reducing manual work um, and uh, making it so we can get into our stuff a little bit faster? I think that mm -hmm. ultimately is like from a developmental standpoint, I think that would bring a lot more life to this piece. Yeah, totally. Totally. Cool. All right. And why you picked when why you picked the, the, these 10. Yeah. Yeah, and then yeah, and then with each of these, yeah, sign post, <clears throat> you know, Gong sales enablement software does blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, I think we could take a couple minutes break here. Um, I'm gonna run a mid roll for our uh, sponsor, Hrefs, uh, doing some wonderful stuff over there. Check out the Hrefs Webmaster Tools, absolutely free. Uh, they're doing some really cool stuff help you uh, get a lot of your search optimization stuff in order. I'm going to go grab some water. Erica, I'll see you in like two minutes or so. Nice. I'm going to make a coffee.
While we wait for the edit, let me tell you a little bit about Ahrefs Webmaster Tools. Now, when I started the content studio, Ahrefs was the first tool that I bought, and this will give you a taste of why. There are two parts to Ahrefs Webmaster Tools, Site Audit and Site Explorer. Site Audit scans up to 5,000 pages per month and searches for over 100 predefined issues that could hurt your site's rankings. Once the audit's finished, you'll see your website's health score, a breakdown of the top issues, and how many URLs are affected. And if you need a refresher on what these issues are, they make it easy to see what it is and tell you how to fix it. To see which pages are affected by an issue, click on the number beside it, and you'll get a full list of URLs which you can then export and fix. They even made it easy to look at each category of issue with these super handy links in the sidebar. So if you wanna see on-page issues, click over here, and now you've got a nice summarized report of things like word counts, title tags, and meta descriptions. You can also click on the issues tab to see a list of issues labeled by importance so you can prioritize appropriately. The second part of Webmaster Tools is Site Explorer, which gives you a look into your backlink and search traffic data. Starting on Site Explorer's overview page, you can see top level metrics for your website like domain rating, total backlinks, total referring domains, and the number of keywords your site ranks for, and your estimated search traffic. And right below that is an interactive graph that shows you how fast you're acquiring backlinks from unique websites, which is a good indicator of your site's popularity. In this report, you'll see useful things like the website and page authority metrics of the linking page, and the number of referring domains it has, the estimated search traffic to that page, and the context of the link, which is all super convenient. You can also use these handy filters to really drill in on the data you want to see. There's also the organic keywords report, which shows you all the keywords your website ranks for. You'll also see keyword metrics like search volume, keyword, and difficulty score. You can also see the top content on your site based on their popularity on these social networks. This only scratches the surface of what Webmaster Tools is capable of doing, and you can do this absolutely free. All you have to do is go to ahrefs.com forward slash AWT and verify your site within just a few clicks. All right, let's jump back into the edit. All right, and we are back. Thank you everyone so much for watching the Ahrefs spot here. Um, I just want to get a quick test or uh, uh, vibe from the audience. How are you feeling about this so far? Everything feeling pretty good? Um, yeah, I'd love to get a sense of where you're at, how you're feeling, uh, and if there's any questions that you might have right now, just in general about content, about life, about marketing, uh, in business, um, freelancing, let's let's talk about that for a little bit while um, while we wait, because right now we're waiting for Erica to come back, which is cool, but also it's a really good opportunity for us to engage with each other and uh, start that dialogue. So, okay, question, question, for such listicles where you're supposed to list down high ticket sales tools. Okay, I am getting uh, a message right here. Uh, for listicles where you're supposed to list down high ticket sales tools, many of which don't really offer a free version or have a limited free version, uh, and considering you're not in-house, and also considering these tools have integrated AI into their platforms just recently, so there's not much information out there other than their website. How can these listicles be made a bit more engaging? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so the, to recap on that, basically it's if a, a lot of new tools are coming out there, <laughs> uh, what is the meaning of life, Octavia? 42. Uh, we just don't know what the question is yet. Um, so, yeah, the, the, basically the question here was uh, tools that have a limited free version, uh, you're not in-house, and this is from, an, uh, from a, um, the perspective of a freelancer, and the company has just launched the AI version of their tool. Uh, how do you make it interesting or engaging? What I would ask in a scenario like that is, uh, yeah, see, there we go. What I would ask in a scenario like that, if it's not possible to get access from the company directly to customers, um, would be to find out from people who are starting to use these tools um, ways that, like, can you get real perspectives from that instead of just trying to make stuff up? So uh, the question 
uh, Erica, welcome back, by the way, um, was uh, four listicles where you're supposed to list high ticket sales tools, many of which don't offer a free version or have limited free versions. And considering you're not in house and also considering that these tools have integrated AI into their platforms just recently. So there's not a lot of information out there uh, other than what's on their website. How can you make them a bit more engaging? Mm. I was starting to say that I think probably the best way is to get in touch with people who are using mm -hmm. it. If the company won't get you in touch, then you reach out. Um, something like uh, a lot of like a, a company called builtwith.com. Are you familiar with builtwith? No. Okay. So builtwith.com is great because it will, you can look at a website and then it will tell you all the tools that are integrated into that website. Oh, oh yes. Oh, you know what? Yes. I um, do know there's that. another one out there like Wappalizer. There's a few of them like that, mm -hmm. but basically you use, uh, you, you try to find people who are using these tools, right? And then reach out if, if you're, if you're, if the company's not willing to get you in touch with the people who are using this stuff so you can get a real perspective, which absolutely 100% push for that. Yeah. Um, if that's not the case though, then you go out on your own and you find what people are saying um, and just get those real perspectives. And how is this being used in your day? And if mm -hmm. you can't have any of that, then really try and role play with yourself. Like there's a lot, I, I think there's a, a lost art of um, meditation on some of these topics that we talk about, right? Um, mm -hmm. I know personally, yeah, Naveen says, ask for a short demo, ask them to describe the tool's usage on an intro call, maybe. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I really just like to meditate on a lot of stuff where it's just like, try to really build the story and scenario. I don't know. What do you think? I don't, I don't have much to add to that. I think it's a real shame that businesses don't help writers actually make the pieces good. Yeah. You know, I can't, I can't think of a reason why you wouldn't except you don't you don't think it's worth a worthwhile investment of your time or you literally don't have time but you feel like you still need to get the content out anyway so you'll fix it later you know which you probably never, never will if never you have will. that mindset um so yeah also i mean the only other thing i would add is um if you have any type of online presence you can ask people Right. So um, you can put out a post asking. I, I see people do that all the time. Like, hey, do you know anyone that uses this or that? I'd love to talk to them for an article. Um, but yeah, I think those your suggestions are probably the best. Yeah. No, I think I mean, reaching out to people, I, I, I mean, real people is always going to be the best, the best yeah. in general. Um, OK, so Jasmine Jade here, which, by the way, hi. Um, we're, we're, you have, you're one of our bonus, uh, edits today. Um, she says, what are you doing to write better thought leadership content? The kind where you have heavy subject matter influence. How do you write such articles without having it sound like a quote fest? Ooh, Ooh, I actually, I have this whole thing that I'm like trying to write out as it relates to, uh, this in general. Um, take it away. Well, I don't know if my thoughts are fully formulated on this or not yet, but um, basically what I look at in, because uh, I'm starting to get more into, I was saying this before, I'm getting more into my screenwriting um, background. Yeah. And one of the things that comes up in a lot of stories is your, your um, mentor type character, right? They're introduced right around the start of the second act, right? If you're looking at the traditional hero's journey perspective, um, you've got, uh, the refusal of the call, or I, I, I don't remember all the steps off the top of my head, which I feel like a fraud now for saying it, but, um, but at some point in the story, very early on, a mentor shows up and that mentor, um, is the one that gives advice. In this case, I think with a lot of subject matter experts, we have a tendency to just throw out quotes from people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, that sound kind of vaguely related to what it is that we're trying to do. Um, and most of them are just quotes that somebody pulled from some other website. Uh, yep. I think one of the best things that I would recommend if it, without it going to sound like a huge quote fest, two things. Um, and it's actually relatively simple. If you ever want to quote me in an article, please just email me. 
and I will be more than happy to give you some original thoughts um, because I like seeing my name on lights just like everybody else. Um, Same. I'll hop on that. Yeah, you just can you can you can email me just or LinkedIn me. Whatever your whatever the story is that you're trying to tell, if you're trying to be a subject matter expert or uh, and you want to incorporate some of that, email people and say, "Hey, I'm writing a story on. I would love to get your thoughts on. Here's where roughly it would fit in, right? I think when I get asked for quotations quite a bit, mm -hmm. um, I'm not actually given the surrounding context of like where my quote might fit into this thing. So it'd be cool to know like what that story is going to be. If you're trying to be a thought leader yourself, um, then yeah, give people an idea of where they're going to fit. So you're not trying to retrofit their stuff into what it is that you're saying. Um, and then, yeah, Eric, you're more of a thought leader than I am. So no, I'm not. Yeah, you are. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. I have a lot of thoughts. You, I don't know if I'm... Are you leading people with those thoughts? I don't, I'm not leading people with my thoughts. I, I don't know. I mean, I, what am I talking about? We've got people here I'm, watching I'm, us live because. I, I hope I'm, I guess I hope I'm leading people with yeah. my thoughts. Um, but I, I wouldn't say I'm more of a thought leader than you. But um, I did just pull up. Uh, well, I you're leading with... my thoughts. Oh, well, thank you. I, did I tell you? I don't know if I told you this. Um, I got in a call with Devin Reed the other day. And he yep. said that I say everything in his head and I just say it out loud and in a way that he hasn't been able to say it. And I was like, yeah, oh my God, am I, am I, am I, you are, um, I'm going to share this in the chat because I was quoted the other day in a buffer article and I think it was pretty good. Um, and again, like this is the brand allowing the writer to take a first person perspective, which is much easier when the writer actually works for the, the business than a freelancer. But I think that this is a really cool way to do it. The title is, I want to pivot my personal brand. Six experts told me how to do it, right? So you're already framing it with a, I want to achieve this outcome rather than like, here are the six ways to pivot your personal brand. And then it's just like this, this quote fest. Um, mm. And it starts with a story. So the first sentence is, in my 20s, I fell down a health and fitness rabbit hole, right? Okay. And then, well, not so much fell as hurt old head first, banged my head a bit and didn't emerge until a good few days, few years later, not days. Um, anyway, then it's kind of funny and blah, 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 blah. And um, it kind of, the point is that she dabbled a bit on social and then um, started to create content for Buffer. And now she's been actively posting on LinkedIn for a few months, but like, what do I do? Right. So then I called mm. on these experts and um Again, like I think it's it's done well because you start with setting up some context. Like, so how do you do this thing? There's two major reasons to do it. Here's what this this expert has to say about it, um, and then, you know, you add your own take on it essentially, which I think is the best way to do it. You yeah, you set you set them up with the con with important context. Maybe start with a story, then you add the quote in, and then you add your own take. You don't have to always agree with it. You can agree, you can disagree, um, but you end with your take rather than just like quote, 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 quote. Okay, like, thanks for coming. Yeah, that's uh, the, the, the big part about leadership in general is being willing to be wrong or have people disagree with you. Um, yeah. And I think when a lot of people talk about being a thought leader, they don't want people to disagree with them. They just want, you know, people to follow their thoughts. And it's like, no, nope, you gotta make some enemies along the way if you wanna be a thought leader because Totally. Like, yeah. Like there are plenty of people who I follow who I'm like, I, they, I see why they piss a bunch of other people off in the process. Like, you know, yeah. um, Rand Fishkin was actually on the show, uh, early, early, early. And one of the things that we talked about is who are your enemies, right? And do, yeah. you have to know who your enemies are. You have to know, you know, I was saying this earlier Two forces of antagonism. What are the things that you stand against? You cannot be a leader if you are not charging against something, right? You yeah. have to stand for something. Um, and for me to kind of go uh, to answer this question, I think a little bit differently, um, to answer the question directly of how, what am I trying to do or what am I doing to write better thought leadership content? First of all, um, I want to get out of the mindset of thought leadership being a format. It's not. Mm -hmm. uh, Tracy mm -hmm. Wallace said this in the very first episode. It's not a format. It's an outcome, um, which was stay, stay with me forever. Um, 
but for me, it's, it's also going like, where do my thoughts come from? Where, where is, where does all of my stuff come from? Um, I've been leaning a lot more heavily on my filmmaker background recently. Uh, mm -hmm. and I'm taking quotes from those people and contextualizing what I know from that side over into what I know on this side to then create this nice hybrid of like what filmmaking and B2B marketing can do together. So when I do use quotes, it's from somebody you've probably never heard of before. Be and that makes things, I think what that does, and this isn't like an engineered thing by any stretch of the imagination, but it's like, I think that makes me feel, I feel a little bit more credible when I see other people do something similar. Where it's like, I'd never heard of this person. I'm not just somebody in the marketing echo chamber, mm -hmm. like quoting somebody else who everybody else knows. I'm quoting somebody who you don't know, talking about things that you aren't familiar with and then applying those in a way that you are. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like for me personally, that's how I'm trying to write better thought leadership content. Thought leadership content is to like draw on experiences that are not the same, our collective same experience. Um, and then yes. share quotes from those people. Totally. Like our collective, uh, this B2B does this all the time. Like we're all in each other's echo chamber, yeah. right? Like, yeah, we all have a collective experience and that's nice. But if, as we know, if you want to stand out in the sea of sameness, um, <laughs> then you have to say, <laughs> you have to say something that's actually different. Um, so I totally agree with that. Like, I understand people quote people that have audiences so that they can get their, you know, distribution and all of that. And, you know, fine. Um, but you should also quote people that are actually experts on things as well that aren't very known. Mm. I think that's more intriguing. If you know who those people are, it shows you, shows people that you actually are in really in that. And you didn't just like Google the top 10 people. In this, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing is, and it's like jump back on that idea of, um, I was just at a conference last week. Ryan was there. Ryan was just on the on the show, um, and there was a session in there where it was uh, it was called Spicy Takes or something like that, where it was like mm -hmm. six ten minute sessions on some spicy take. Okay. None of them were spicy. Really. I didn't. Was feel... it was it like an unpopular opinion that was actually popular? It was. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of unpopular opinion, or it was supposed to be an unpopular opinion, but then it was like. Brand is important because I'm like, really? Um, you know, we're all saying there's a lot of the same stuff that's being said. Um, I think that, you know, I'll, I'll give you an actual spicy take, right? Here's an okay. actual spicy take, right? The playbook, everyone talks about the playbook is the playbook dead, right? The, the, write the blog that sends to the newsletter that the that newsletter tries to sell a thing, whatever. No, the playbook mm -hmm. is not dead. The playbook is not dead. The playbook is going to be the playbook uh, as it has been for now until the uh, eternity, right? Um, TV's been running the same playbook for almost a century, 80 years. TV's been running the exact same playbook where if you want to sell advertising space, you have a show, you sell the ads in the middle um, in between commercial breaks, and then uh, that's it. That's the only way that you can really make money if you're selling stuff on TV. You could say product placement, but that's even that predates – uh, predates TV by uh, like 20 or 30 years or so. No, no, like the 1890s um, with product placement. So my spicy take is that we are actually just executing improperly. It's not the playbook. It's the way that we execute on the same steps that we as marketers are getting bored. Mm -hmm. But it's not the delivery mechanism of the thing. Right. So like, okay. So like, anyways, that's, that's, that's an actual, I don't know if that's actually a spicy take, but feel spicy. to well, me. Why are we getting bored? What's your, what do we do to fix it? What do we do to fix it? We are, are willing to say, you know, no to SEO content. <laughs> no, it's not. We, we have to, the thing that we have to look at is go like, okay, thought leadership content, which is fun to write SEO content, which is no fun to write. Like, no, these are like, did we, the whole Verge article came out. Did you see this recently? Verge article, right? Yeah. Yeah. There are actually so many different points of that article that I agree with. 
mm-hmm. where I'm like, did we ruin the internet? Kind of. Kind of. Yeah. Actually, yeah, we did. You know why we did? Because we felt like SEO content was supposed to be a certain type of content, and not something where it's like, let's use this as a delivery mechanism to show how we feel about this particular subject. Instead, we have to dial everything down and say, oh my God, I'm heated now. We've just, we've just been doing this for a while now. No, it's, it's, mm-hmm. we, we actually did this where we said, okay, if it's SEO content, then it has to read this certain way. It has to have this particular cadence and it's got to have all of these points and not have any level of personality that goes into it, right? Yeah. We can't lead thoughts in an SEO piece of content. And it's like, no, we absolutely can because that is our delivery mechanism. That's how we're getting people in the door. And if we want to get, bring people further in, then we have to give our own thought leadership inside mm-hmm. that where it's somebody searching for this. Now we can be different. Yeah. But well, that's same, what we were just, that's how right? we were just dissecting that last piece. Like the last one with, with the listicle and the tools and the drift and the gong, like that was very, that read to me as very SEO. Yeah. Um, it didn't have much personality in it. And that is again, not the writer's fault. Like that right. was the brief. I am sure of it. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, look at the brand. Yeah. The brand that was so, briefing it. Absolutely. Right. There's just, yeah, I totally agree. Um, I just think there's, there's much more that we can do. Well, so. see, if you agree with me though, I can't have a spicy take. Well, I don't know if your take is that spicy, Tommy. Ah, I'm with you. Damn it. You need to get spicier. Damn it. All right. Well, all right. Um, yeah, no. And Octavia says, we did ruin the internet, and now we're ruining it at high AI speed. And uh, it turns out uh, my, my 10-year-old is watching this from the bus right now, too. So hi. Oh, cute. Hi. Hi, Leo. Um, yeah, I he's... kicked my kids out of the house, not like they understand me yet, but <laughs> they're not here. Um, I was like, I've got a five-hour call. Everyone needs to leave the house, including the dog. Get out. <laughs> Uh, Naveen says, we absolutely can lead thoughts in an SEO article. The structure has to be SEO written, has to be thought about thought leadership or oriented. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's all the same, right? Think about this yeah. for a second. Best thought leadership content. And we all know this, the 10,000 true fans, right? Or a thousand true fans, right? Mm-hmm. Every single person here has read it. I'm, and if you haven't, then Google 1000 true fans. If you haven't read it, then you've at least heard of it. Right. Mm-hmm. And then that's something where that was a thought leadership piece. I don't even know how I discovered it, but I know that I've searched it at a certain point afterwards because I wanted to find it again. Right. So it's like you can do one or the other. Um, anyways. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Nothing is ever dead in marketing marketers. It's all marketing buzz about their personal sentiments, which often doesn't along with the business audience. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yes, we did ruin the internet, but I think we have the opportunity to bring it back. That's what this show is about. That's what we're going to do. We're jumping into another piece. Let's, um, let's do it. Yeah. Let's see. Now I'm, now I'm energized again. All right. What are we doing now? Uh, do you want to do nine strategies for closing more high ticket sales? No, no, no. Let's, um, let's jump into podcast. Consistency doesn't have to be hard. I mean, you're in trouble now. You're on the, uh, you're on the chopping block. So, and I've just had coffee. So, yeah, you just had coffee and I'm all ramped up. And I stood up. I don't know if you saw that, but I tried to like sneakily stand up at the same rate as my desk rising. Oh, no, that was clever. Did I pull it off? So, were you like, "Mm." (laughs) wow, (laughs) we'll have to replay it in slow mo for one of the the magic clips. I'm gonna have to check. (laughs) Perfect. All right. All right. We're, We're getting into the screen here. Um, okay. So, let me just adjust this because my goodness this all ended up wrong um all right so podcast consistency doesn't have to be hard use these seven tips this is from naveen uh at rumble studio he is a SaaS writer and experienced seo strategist specializing in top of the funnel educational pieces with a focus on productivity and mindfulness as its favorite niche okay um so first, first note that I had on this, um, yeah, yeah, they're getting ready to chop them up. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> a little nervous here. Uh, so the first, first thing that really stood out to me is that um, podcast consistency doesn't have to be hard. Uh, we're treating this as like a subject on its own, like 
it, it's almost treated like as if podcast consistency is like a search phrase. Mm -hmm. And maybe it is. I haven't done any of the keyword research behind this or whatever, but it doesn't feel like something I would actually say out loud. Mm -hmm. um, I think the idea is great, right? Podcast yeah. consistency doesn't have to be hard, but the, the phrasing of it itself, right? Podcast consistency doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be hard to be consistent. Use these seven tips to be more consistent with your podcasting. Something along mm -hmm. those lines. What do you think, Erica? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know what that necessarily meant until I got to the bottom of the introduction. Um, so I feel like, do people ever go, I mean, yeah, I would, I would be curious about the keyword research. Like if I Google podcast consistency, it's just not something I guess I would. Naveen says, yes, it is a search phrase. So if I Google podcast consistency, I'm seeing this one as the top. So that's great. Um, how to be a consistent podcaster, consistency in podcasting. How do you, how podcast consistency leads to a successful podcast, the benefits of consistently publishing podcast episodes, questions to ask for podcast consistency. So, okay. It's definitely a thing. Um, this is one yeah. of those things where I would say, forget what Google's saying. As far as like the search phrase itself, honestly, like, because it doesn't, to me, it doesn't read natural, mm -hmm. um, how to be more consistent with podcasting. Absolutely. That is something where I've actually Googled that thing because it is hard. There's not just, it's like, it, it's an emotional game, right? Yeah. Uh, as somebody who does this week after week, um, absolutely. Uh, but just the phraseology of podcast consistency I would say, okay, Google is also has latent semantic, latent semantic indexing. We already have an idea of what the different phrases are that are somehow related to each other. Let's just, if, even if this particular phrase has a slightly higher keyword volume, let's, let's call it something different. That's not search algorithm. Yeah, it does feel searchy. Yeah. Yeah. So understand what is consistency for podcasts, why it's so important and how to achieve consistency for your podcast to prevent a po eventual pod fade. I like the phrase pod fade, by the way. I think that's great. Yeah. Um, again, this is all starting to feel like just in the, in the title here though, or the little subline here, um, consistency for podcasts, why it's so important and how to achieve consistency for your podcast. Like understand what is consistency for podcasts. That particular line is very clearly still trying to be search optimized mm -hmm. consistency is a fairly self-evident um phrase right like it's yep. a it's a fairly self-evident word so i wouldn't i wouldn't even need that i will say this though when jacob realizes he's missing a new episodes from his favorite or several of his favorite podcasts he begins to wonder if the podcast frequency has changed or if they've canceled their shows altogether he checks their facebook twitter linkedin pages to check for any announcements this is like my favorite and I'm actually going to, uh, the, the article that you gave me for yours, I'm going to put mm -hmm. this intro up against your intro later. Um, uh, because this is a great example of, and I would actually want to do something like this with the sales piece that we were just looking at before too, um, or the AI sales tools. This is the perfect scenario of what it is that the person on the other side of the screen is thinking or what they're doing when you're not consistent. Yeah, I love it. It's a great opening. It's a really good opening. Yeah. My problem comes in paragraph one, two, three, four. My par my problem comes in paragraph four. All right, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get, we'll we'll get, get there. there. All right. Turns out one of the hosts is on a long vacation with his family. Another host is taken a hiatus to reimagine the entire show from scratch a third podcast host to shut down the show entirely because they didn't find many listeners out of his human tendency for self-blame jacob thinks if i only appreciated these creators more while their shows were still alive i definitely fall on the <laughs> other side of that category while we've taken 
a month off because I had too much uh, client work going on at the same time. Um, so thank you for throwing that in my face, Naveen. I feel actually, um, I feel like maybe when I didn't publish, you were, I, I feel like maybe you were writing this about me. <laughs> but I'm an online creator, so of course everything is about me. Why not? Um, <laughs> what all of these hosts are going through is called pod fade. It is a term to describe the gradual or sometimes sudden ramp down in the production of podcast episodes. Yes. I okay, here's, love this. Here's my problem. Here's okay, my problem. Go for it. We're now at that your is, paragraph. That is such a good setup. And then you don't switch to talk to the reader directly because this is your opportunity to be like, hey, you reader, like you solve this by being consistent, by being consistent. Because when this sentence here, when podcasts can release episodes on the same day-to-day -day cadence, they help form a habit for their listeners. You're putting podcasts in control here. Mm. Like, speak directly to the reader here. Like, you've set it up so well. You've got me emotionally hooked. I'm in it. I want you to look at me now and be like, do better. Here's how. I'm going to help you. Right? Like, make me feel like I'm in the driver's seat. So you can totally solve this by just being like, um, you know, to keep your readers happy and make sure that you're publishing consistently, like make sure that you um, like the, the best way to do this is to form a habit for your readers. But like, Hey, it's not a magical switch. It's just a principle. Like putting into practice is a whole other ball game. Like, don't worry. Like we've got you, like you'll never have to upset Jacob again. Right? Like you want your last line to tie back to your first line. Like that is this key element of storytelling that I think most people get wrong and they miss out on. And mm so important like your your last line you want you're connecting a thread right and so you're introducing this character and then you're like hey uh you like here's how to make sure that you don't do that like jacob is now happy right like the end like nice little cute story like we got you um so i just like these last three could have just been like you didn't have to take me out of the story mm. the whole thing could have been a story i love it i love it and uh, yeah, and I've definitely been in Jacob's seat too. I actually got, I stopped listening to a podcaster. I really liked this podcast. Um, and then they weren't publishing as frequently as I would have liked them to. And I was like, God, damn, like, or they started repurposing yeah. their repurposed stuff. And they're re like, they just kept doing it. And I'm like, I know as a creator why that's happening. Um, but also like, I want new <clears throat> stuff to listen to. So yeah, I, uh, this definitely connects. I really like all this. And yeah, you can definitely keep that um, through line here with what you're saying, Erica. Now, yeah. I will say this. I am now, as a creator, as somebody who's on as the reader for this, and I absolutely 100% am the reader for this, mm -hmm. I am now also on my toes. Yeah. Right? Because... Podcast consistency doesn't have to be hard. Actually, it really can be. Yeah. Right? There's production issues. There's life issues. There's uh, all sorts of stuff. In this case, like on this show, right now I'm getting really specific and selfish with this article. But again, as a reader, I'm going to be selfish with any of the advice that I'm reading. Mm -hmm. um, I do this live once a week. Right. Is there something there? Like, are you going to tell me this is just my my initial thoughts? I haven't read the, the entire thing yet, but are you going to tell me, oh, just schedule yourself in advance? Oh, just do X, Y, Z things that make it sound really easy. I don't know. You're seeing this for the first time. Uh, I'm seeing this at the same time you are. I've skimmed it, but I haven't read the whole thing. I'm just letting you know now, Naveen, where my uh, hesitation is. Because now, as the reader, I'm a little on edge. Important to know. Um, before we get into this a little bit more, uh, Wade Nelson says, what does searchy mean? You use that phrase, Erica. What phrase? Searchy. Searchy? When did I say that? You what did it, I say? It feels a little searchy to me. When did I say that? <laughs> I can't remember. When we were talking about the, the article itself, podcast consistency doesn't have to be hard. He says it feels oh, a little oh, searchy. Oh, oh, I searchy it, it just it's my it's just my made-up word of saying it's written for a robot uh the google robot -y side of of search and rankings as opposed to the humans 
Beep boop. Yeah. Um, okay, so what is consistency in podcasts? Ugh. I already hate I hate I hate I hate this. Not this I not this specifically. I hate this in every single article that does the what is in a very self evident um, phrase. I know that we're all trying to go after the featured snippet here. <laughs> Sometimes we need to just not do it for the sake of the reader. But um, what is consistency in podcast? Consistency in podcast means releasing high quality episodes with great content on a fixed schedule over the long term. <sighs> different people choose to focus on different parts of this definition. For example, some might say consistency and quality is more important. Sometimes someone else might say releasing episodes on a fixed schedule to induce a habit formation as the definition of a consistency. Actually, you know what? I'm not mad at this. I'm going to kill mm -hmm. this first sentence. Mm -hmm. Because, like, <coughs> damn it, I know what consistency means. Yep. But to kill that and then say different people choose to focus on different parts of, focus on different elements of consistency, right? Or different different right i would say okay so i would say with the snippet in mind because if you're a writer and you're writing for someone that cares about the snippet right you can't be as creative as we both want to be here i would say for the snippet in mind um instead of different people choose to focus on different meanings of consistency you could say um, I, I'm gonna say the same thing differently. So never mind. I was just gonna say there's something along the lines of there's a there's a debate on what consistency means in podcasts, right? And then you get to kind of put the keyword in again. I it's like the that. Same, it's the same thing. I like that. No, that's good. Here, you you swap that out. Go for it. Um. So for example. Oops. For example, I really like that actually. I'm I, as somebody who is uh, mad at what is consistency in podcasts, reading this for the first time, I'm not mad at that. Actually, that's uh like legitimately one of the things I've I see this so many times and just roll my eyes. Yeah. But this is actually really good. Yeah. That reverses my expectations of what this type of thing is supposed to be about. If we cut that first line. Yep. Cut the first line and then this is actually like, oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, let's see. So, Trippy says, I was waiting for the actual point that he would have made uh, work because it's served generally. And so, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, great work. Great work here. Um, so, for example, some might say consistency and quality is more important. Others might say episodes on a fixed schedule to induce a habit formation is definition of consistency. Absolutely. But mm -hmm. what... Uh, are we talking about when you say you have to be consistent with your podcast to overcome pod fade? Consistency can be seen in three different parts, maintaining a consistent release schedule, consistently providing high quality episodes, and consistency by achieving longevity of your show. Ooh, okay. All right. I'm interested. Yep. I'm interested. Mm -hmm. I'm in. Okay. Maintaining a consistent release schedule. Maintain consistency by releasing episodes at a regular frequency on the same day and time every week, i.e., for example, a weekly podcast shouldn't just release one episode every week. They should pick a single time on a fixed day of the week to release the episode. If their first episode dropped on Monday at 10 a.m. PST, all subsequent episodes should be out on every Monday at 10 a.m. PST. This helps uh, listeners regularly or reliably integrate, I can't talk anymore, <laughs> uh, the podcast into their lives. Okay. It's just redundant. Yeah. So you you said the same thing twice in a row. So it just flows better to say release it on the same day and time every week. If their first episode dropped on a Monday, all subsequent episodes should come out on a Monday. This helps listeners reliably integrate the podcast into their lives. I think there's an interesting thing you could say about like the science of habit forming or something about because you're just kind of again saying this helps listeners do this thing. And my immediate response is like, why do I trust you? Mm. You know, like, is that really true? Is this backed up? Like, does it matter? Like, what if I'm really, really struggling to do this? Um, 
I'm trying every, everything I can to get it out Monday at 10 a.m. PST, but I keep getting it out like Monday, 10 a.m. Then the next week, it's like Monday, 7 p.m. Then the next week, it's like Wednesday, 10 a.m. Like, tell me why I really need to do this because I'm, I'm really, really, really struggling. Mm. Um, so that could like push me over the edge of like, damn, okay. I know it in the back of my mind. You just proved it to me. Now I'm really going to try. I think if we're talking about habit formation, so something that's interesting to me about this is like, if we were to incorporate some sort of research, I'm not sure how I feel about the research. I'm not sure how I feel about the section <clears throat> as a whole, to be honest with okay. you. Um, just because like now we're starting to talk about like maintaining a consistent maintaining a consistent release schedule <sighs> like i kind of already know what consistent i have my own definition of consistent in my head mm -hmm. as i'm looking at this if i need some sort of validation like i don't i i just i don't know about the entire section to be honest with you um and this is one of the things that i was a little concerned about looking at it Mm -hmm. Now, if we were to, do I need to validate with research? Do I need this period? I don't know. This is the part where, I don't know, Eric, I'm, I'm, having, a, I'm having an existential <laughs> crisis on this section. This was what I was <laughs> expecting, and this is not, after having my expectations broken in the very beginning to then have something that I was expecting, yeah, makes me feel a little cheated in some way. I does think that sense? it does. Yeah, I mean, it's really, really high level. And probably if you're here to tell me it doesn't have to be hard telling me that I need to do like the easy, the quote unquote easiest thing in the world that I'm just still not able to do is a little bit like popping my balloon, right? Like, yeah, you're telling me it doesn't have to be hard. You set this beautiful story telling me like, you know, I'm going to help you not do this pod fade thing. And then it's like podcasting 101, like release it at the same day and same time. Like it, you know, like it's not, it's not very interesting. And it's, I think it's telling the reader what they already know and it doesn't help solve any problems. Um, I'm kind of more interested. I haven't read it yet, but um, why consistency is so important. Like I'm kind of more interested in that before we even get to this kind of advice. And then when we do get to it, I would want it to be way more, like way less high level. But if you go to the next section where it says listeners are creatures of habit and it starts with Game of Thrones, like that's interesting, right? Right. So like keep with the storytelling, keep me invested. Like I would really, I would cut this whole, this whole bit under maintaining, maintaining a consistent release schedule and talk about why it's important in the first place. Um, and then, you know, give me some like actual ways, like tell me at the end, after you tell me why, you know, I know, like you say to me, like, I know, you know, that you should release podcasts at the same time every week. Like everyone that does a podcast knows that it's hard because whatever, you know, like build some empathy and then give me like your way to fix that. Yeah. I think that can be much more interesting than starting with make sure you publish at the same time every day. It's just, it's a bit deflating. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's really what it is, is at this point, like, you've given me empathy on the reader's perspective. Now I want, like, you, you've, you've given me empathy <clears throat> for the person who's missing out on my show. Yeah. Now show, yeah, show me a little bit of that same bit of grace because it's like, okay, now we know why you're here. Yeah. Right? If we, I think the the story is really like <clears throat> understanding the search intent. If this is going after search, um, but yeah, no, definitely show me a little bit of grace and be like, here's why I know you're not consistent. It reads like the writer is Jacob rather than Tommy, right? You know, and the writer needs to understand Jacob, but you really need to understand Tommy better than Jacob. Yeah. And the, re um, I mean, and the reader is supposed to be me. Right. Exactly. And I'm not getting that. Right. I'm not getting that so far. So far. Now I'm going to say this, right? Consistency can be seen in three different parts. I'm going to see if these three bullet points can just remain bullet points. And if these three things can be cut. Mm -hmm. Right. So 
consistently providing high quality episodes, multiple factors, uh, always having highly relevant guests. Nope. Not every show is a podcast. Not every show is talking heads. Um, showing up with enthusiasm. Okay. Recording high quality audio. Sure. Anything you have to show. Okay. Yep. No, we could kill all this. Yeah, I agree. All these things are self-evident. Mm-hmm. Um, so consistency is not about robot-like sameness. Okay. So yeah, and I think that still flows well, right? Mm -hmm. Consistency can be seen in three different parts, maintaining a consistent release schedule, consistently providing high quality episodes, consistently by, uh, consistency by achieving longevity of your show. Consistency is not about robot-like sameness. Cool. We already said it. We, we said everything yep. else. All the other stuff is implied. And now we can keep moving on. Your listeners like variations of your topic and guest choice for each episode. Um, guest choice, again, not every podcast. And I've, I've railed on other, um, I, I've railed on other things that are geared towards podcasters in general because not every podcast is, and, and the majority of podcasts are not actually interviewed base. So, um, your listeners are variations of your topic for each episode, but nobody likes sudden major shifts. Therefore, you must balance predictability and variability and to keep your audience excited about the show. Sure. If it's a discussion show and your audience likes it, don't suddenly shift into a narrative uh, format or panel discussion. Instead, first communicate with your audience about how and when your show's format will change. If you host a weekly live stream where you talk to content marketing professionals about their content marketing philosophy process and pregame, then do not go and do an edit-a-thon because that's not what people are expecting. Why not? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, why consistency is so important with podcasting. Okay, this is, yeah. This is where I started to get a little concerned. Um, yeah. This is where I was concerned it was going to head, and now it's, it's headed there. Um, why consistency? Yeah, you started to talk about this already. Um, committed its audience for uh, the final season. People changed their schedules, took breaks from work. Organized watch parties, the same for Rick and Morty circles. Um, yeah. Yeah. I feel like we're not answering, we're not answering. You're not, you're not telling me how to avoid podcast fate at all yet. Yeah. Like, we're harping a lot on consistency. And if you look at the outline, which I've, I've got the outline bit open on the left. Um, it, this whole, this entire, every H3 under this is about consistency, it seems, except for two. So four out of the six are about consistency. Um, again, I feel like it starts by telling you, you sucked at being consistent and here we're going to help you be more consistent. And now We've, we're going to be spending like a thousand words explaining why consistency is important. I don't know if that matches the intent of the title. Right. Yeah. What I, so as, as the reader for this, right. And we're going to like, I am your ideal reader for this, this article. Um, yeah. It says feedback accepted. Good. I am your reader for this article. Period. Um, I struggle with consistency from time to time. Uh, there is an episode from two weeks ago that we still haven't released because of the uh, I, I haven't been satisfied with the edit uh, of the uh, intro that we've put together. Um, mm. And as a result of that, the episode that came after it last week's episode also has not had its feedback or its edit uh, done. Right. So on the replay side of things, I have not been consistent and. Um, you're telling me that it doesn't have to be hard and maybe there's some truth to that. Maybe there are some operations that I could be doing to improve. Um, maybe there are things that I am missing when it comes to the overarching, uh, like the operational side of things. Maybe I have to be willing to let go of certain, um, quality standards, right? We've had some guests on the show where, um, they've said, you know, be willing to go with about 80% of your quality bar, you know, 85% of where your quality bar is, if that means that you can still be consistent and just try to get better 
to release on a consistent schedule. Um, what, as the reader, I don't necessarily want is for you to tell me why consistency is important. I know it's important, and I'm actually beating myself up that I'm not releasing stuff when it needs to be because I know how important it is. Um, yeah. What I would like is for you to tell me how it doesn't have to be hard, though. Like, so, so yeah. I mean, I'm literally looking at embrace imperfect episodes lower down. <laughs> oh, all right. I think there's a section, another H2 that says how to make your podcast past podcast consistent. I actually think you remove the entire first H2 or the, the, sorry, it's the second one. So you've got what is consistency in podcasts and then why consistency is so important. I do not think we need that. I just think we jump straight to how to make your podcast consistent. All right, cool. That's the intent, right? All right. So that's, see, I'm going off. I didn't read the whole thing. I didn't either. I'm just looking at the outline. Okay. So then how to make your podcast consistent. Infuse passion into your podcast. Okay. If you don't know why you're talk talking about a specific sounds. Okay. 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 Don't break. Yeah. All right. Take. Okay. So like with this, I want this to go, I want this to go how to make your podcast more consistent, right? Keep things simple and take the pain out of podcasting, embrace imperfect episodes. Um, don't make promises to your listeners that you can't keep. I want that one to be last. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, Infuse passion into your podcast. I don't know if this actually has a place. Yeah, I don't. I don't get that one. That's. I mean, I'm very passionate about this show, and I'm still not as consistent as I'd like to be, and that just makes me like. I don't feel like crap. Like I don't want to like, but it doesn't feel good to say infuse passion into your show, and that by proxy that means I'm not being consistent because I'm not passionate about it. Definitely, that's going to be an issue for some people, but. Yeah. In a lot of cases, somebody who is extra passionate might also be the least consistent. Yeah. I would say make that as like a like a bonus extra. Like, hey, by the way, this might be obvious, but like if you're doing something you don't actually like, yeah. you're not going to be consistent with it. So like, don't do that. Okay, bye. You know, like it's like that's all you have to say yep. on that. This was one that I uh, – this was – the one piece that I was like hoping I wouldn't see mm, or at least presented gosh. differently. Right. When I watch, mm. you'll be racing to finish the current episode, release it on time, record a batch <coughs> of three or six episodes at a time. What I would love for something like this. Okay. So start recording episodes in batches. Um, there is, there is the, the how to, this is a what, Right, you're telling me what? Start recording episodes in batches. Cool, but you've acknowledged earlier in the um, in the article that there are you know perfection perfectionism. There's a lot of editing that's involved. There's a lot of extra steps that are involved. Recording episodes in batches is very much the easiest part. Like recording an episode is the easiest part of this entire process. Right, Eric and I are on here right now. We're riffing. We're going at this for hours. Um, that's easy. The hard part is, is sending this over to an editor and doing all of that. So what I would want to see from something like this is like, start recording episodes and batches. Cool. But do I have systems and processes in place for the post recording of what goes out afterwards? So, um, after each episode we have here, we're just now starting to figure out what the systems are on our end, but we're now, uh, uploading these to a tool called cast magic. Awesome tool, by the way, highly recommend it. Um, and then that uh, transcript is now going off to uh, someone to be edited. Then that transcript, the edited transcript, goes over to the video editor. And then they can see basically off of that what could be cut and whatnot. We need to start looking at the overall process um, because just laying down the vocals for this, that's the easiest part. Everything else in the post-production part, super, super, like that's the part that makes it very difficult to be consistent. Um, hey, Tommy, you know what would really help? What? This article speaking to you. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, I'm serious. Speaking to a subject matter expert, like speaking to someone who knows this. 
because that way you could infuse some more storytelling. Like I was expecting this to have more storytelling based on the intro, I guess. Yeah. Um, and it didn't. Yeah. Yeah. And he says back when he wrote it, he didn't maybe understand the audience as much as you should have um, from May, June, 2022. That, mm -hmm. You know, that's not just you though. Like that's not just and, you. Yeah. And, and I know that I'm sounding really passionate about this. I try to actually get this passionate with any of the articles that I edit because I'm trying to think of it from the reader's perspective um, and being the reader for this article, like being the person that it would serve. I definitely have. And then also being an editor, I definitely have like elevated levels of um, passion, I guess about it. But yeah, it's the, it's yeah. This is one of those things where you have a big, big potential to like, this is a subject that can literally be life-changing. Yep. Right? I'm writing about this right now in my newsletter where it's like, think about what the person, like I am up at three o'clock in the morning sometimes trying to solve this specific problem. How can I do things better um, to make sure that I am consistent in releasing on time? And then because the downstream effect of all of this, right, is if you're not releasing consistently, consistency, if you're not releasing consistently, then you also have a much harder time of uh, keeping promises to your advertisers. You have, um, mm. not only are you losing trust with your audience or you're not building habits in them, but you're also not delivering on your CPMs. You're not potentially, you're losing your income as a result of that. Um, you're building a poor reputation amongst the other people who would be advertising with you, et cetera, et cetera. This has the potential to be a game-changing article for the right person who's looking at it. If I'm searching for something like this, right, and we know that it's written for, for search, if I'm asking, how do I be more consistent with my podcasting? There are so many extra stakes that can be incorporated into this. Um, you've set the stakes really well in the very top with Jacob, um, but now we can keep doing our best to make sure that the, we're... we're continuing to deliver on those stakes. So we're not disappointing Jacob. We're not disappointing advertisers. We're not disappointing all of that. So yep. um, actively engage in main relationship maintenance. So anyways, that's just to say, I know I'm railing on this one specific section, but this was one that I was hoping I Well, it's important. Like, I'm glad that this is happening because you are the reader here. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's like rare. It's a therapy session with an article. <laughs> no, it's so good though, because it's rare that writers get this experience to actually mm. talk to the ideal audience and be like, did this resonate? How often do we get to do that? It's so rare. Yeah. And so this is just like a really good example of why understanding the audience and actually speaking to someone who fully gets it if you don't and you can't access that kind of information via research, like that's why it's so important. Otherwise, it's it might it it might rank first. Like I think this is ranking first based on my Google search, quick Google search. But um, you know, cool but what does that mean like is it actually speaking to the audience or is google just like yay you know because it needs to do both yeah or else what is the point yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna not pick on this piece for a second but pick on a different piece that i edited recently mm -hmm. um and it was on repurposing content <clears throat> and and the article and, and and i have to say too like and i and i I have to say this because it's, I think it's one of those rite of passage articles. Anybody who's in B2B SaaS at this point has had to write uh, a handful of different articles. One of them is how to repurpose content. Other ones are like mm -hmm. how to write a landing page, customer journey maps, whatever, right? Like there are a handful mm. where we've all written them. Um, in fact, give a thumbs up in the comments here if you have written one of these articles um, in the past. What are the marketing? What's the marketing funnel? Right. What, what are the three stages of the marketing what is, funnel? What is a marketing mix? What um, is a go-to-market strategy? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and the repurposing article did the exact thing, the exact same thing that I was afraid of here, where it said, you know, you, you start with the big piece of content and then you chop it up into tiny little pieces. Right. And it's like, okay, yep. Perfect. Cool. And what I said in the very beginning of that article, my first real comment was, um, this is actually a lot more labor intensive and time intensive than people who don't do it think it is. Mm -hmm. So, I hope that you deliver on a way to show me how to do this, either not taking a lot of time or 
being honest with me that it's going to take more people than I, I realize. And what the article yeah. was framed as is it said, we're going to talk to, you know, this person over here and this person over here and how they do it um, without taking a lot of time or resources. And then you get further down. It's like, I'm excited as the reader because like, as the person who goes through this on a regular basis, I'm excited going like, oh, somebody's going to tell me how to do it, right? Or how they're doing it as, as a solo creator. Yeah. Get a little bit further down and it's like, oh, well, this person then sends it off to their assistant and then their assistant sends it off to their editor and their editor does that. Da, da, da. And I'm like, <laughs> that wasn't signposted in the very beginning. And because of that, it makes it very difficult to go. You get to a certain point and you're like, I have heard this. Yeah. How do you tell me something that I haven't heard already? Um, and if it is something that I still need to hear, right? How do you, um, and that's because I want to get off of this section in just a second here. But if, if it is something that I have to hear and it's, it's something that is being told by everybody who's looking for something like this, how do you do it in a way that's either more honest um, or it, it, when I write my content code, it's uh, don't paint idyllic pictures, right? Mm -hmm. Record a batch of three to six episodes at a time. So you always have a few episodes in reserve. That's easy to say. Yeah. But what about, okay, so now I have this giant backlog. Now what do I do? Do I send it off to uh, an agency to do it instead of like, there's so much more that needs to be in taken into consideration there. Yeah. And it's just like, how do we be more honest about that? Anyways, you, I'm all caffeinated. I'm all amped up about this now. Let's move on. Um, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> actively engage in relationship maintenance with your audience. Inform your listeners of any significant changes to your podcast. Yes, I like this. Mm -hmm. It will give the freedom to change the frequency, the format, or anything else. Absolutely. Um, that is actually a very, very good tip. Um, if you don't let someone know in advance or don't explain your reasons behind your decision, it could disrupt their schedule. Listeners don't like make, like such major surprises because often podcasts become a part of their habits. Um, this is actually, so I like this because there's also this level of like imposter syndrome. And again, I am the reader for this. Um, there is a level of imposter syndrome sometimes that I have where it's like, if I don't do an episode, will people miss it? Do they care? Does it even matter do, if, I, yeah. if I don't release, right? Um, but this is a nice, this is a nice reminder that like, yeah, even if you do have five people listening to you, some, those five people are going to base, you know, their, their routine around this. Um, one of our favorite YouTubers, yep. uh, my, my son likes to listen to, and Leo, I hope you're still tuning into this. He likes to listen to a YouTube channel called building character where they take your favorite fictional character, uh, from pop culture and build them in dungeons and dragons. Right. <laughs> Um, we listened to that for bedtime and the guy hasn't posted for like, he was posting two, ep two episodes a week and then he wasn't posting anything. He went silent for a little while and then it was like one episode a month. No, as, as somebody who listens to this on a nightly basis, um, there was nothing that said, Hey, I'm not going to be doing this as frequently anymore. And yeah, and that's it, a bummer. And it was, it was a huge bummer. And I'm like, dude, this helps my guy get to sleep at night. Like, at least let me know so I can prepare myself. So I think this right, actively engage in relationship maintenance, that's a really great um, place. Yeah. Yeah. You got to listen to it. Um, I think that's a really good place to have that reminder of like, yeah, actually you do matter to people. Um, all right. Moving on. Stop being a lone wolf podcaster. What do you think here, Erica? Podcasting is not a small industry. There are thousands of hosts starting a podcast every week where there are people, there are networking groups for people to support each other. Going at it alone is a recipe for burnout as a podcast host. Yelp. Mm -hmm. We always recommend all the professionals join a community like SalesCast on Slack or Buzzsprout community on Facebook to keep you inspired and maintain your enthusiasm. Yeah, what do you think? I mean, I think the rest of that's, this is... Yeah, that's good. It's well written. I will say this. It's yeah. well written. It's very, like, it's easy to get through. It's easy to read. Um, from the content development aspect of it, I've definitely said more than my piece on it. I'm struggling with the conclusion. Okay. It feels like it's just wrapping it up. Okay. Um, 
you could probably take something and run with it a bit more than this. Okay. So being consistent as a podcaster has several advantages and will ensure you make measurable progress towards your goals. Like that doesn't actually really say anything. Plus we just spent the entire article saying that. So um, I would probably just cut that and start with, you can achieve like, or I would call back to the word pod fade, which I don't know if that's even been mentioned since the, the let me Google, let mm. me, I mean, let me search pod fade. It was mentioned eight times. Uh, consistency is the antidote to pod fade. And then it was mentioned once in this H2 that we were just in. I would totally call back to pod fade. Like the whole point of this is to to avoid this pod fade thing, right? So yeah. I, I would bring that back into the conclusion. Uh, you can avoid pod fade, um, you know, and achieve consistency without compromising on the quality of your show. This can make your work and your life easier. Even bring Jacob back into it, you know? Why not? Like call back to the story. Um, or, or I'd love to see, and people rarely this, I'd love to see the conclusion also be like a story, like the ending to the story. Yeah. I know it's unusual, especially for SEO, but it could be really cool to be like, uh, you know, Jacob woke up that day and noticed that his favorite podcaster, uh, was back and he was so happy and, uh, he was curious why he disappeared. So he went to his website and realized he, you know, put out a whatever saying like, Hey, this is why I hadn't been able to do it, but I've actually started to do this, 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 and that now. So I'm going to do my best to be more consistent. Um, and they all lived happily ever after. I don't know, something stupid, but yeah. like something, right. Yeah. Rather than just by following the tips in this article, your podcast is sure to enjoy the level of success it deserves. Like it's just very generic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was such a unique opening too. Like, absolutely. yeah, it was such a unique opening. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about how Jacob's now very happy with us. <laughs> yeah. And so happy that you're publishing on a regular basis now that he's referring to all his friends. Right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> all right. So I just realized we're at, it's already 4:30. My goodness. It is. We've been It is. We've been going. 6 crazy. articles might have been a a bit of a bit ambitious. Bit ambitious. All right. So let's see. Do we want to go with uh here. I want you to edit me now. Okay. And then I'm going to close with editing you. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we're going to do that. So we're going to go this article. How many people are here? Are people still with us? Yeah, people are still with us. They're still here. Amazing. I'm not telling you how many, but there are people. <laughs> By the way, people, thank you for uh, still being with us. Um, some of you have been here from the very beginning, and that makes me feel very happy. That's uh, awesome. Because that's a long time. And I know for a lot of folks, it's actually super duper late right now, too. So um, so thank you so much. That is oh, awesome. Looks like my son is calling me at the moment. And uh, you were just watching the show. How do you know that I'm not able to talk? Anyways. All right. So this article, it's not really an article. It was part of my newsletter. Uh, it was Write Better Endings Part 3 of 5. Um, in this series, I'll give you a context because you are um, just getting caught up here. Mm -hmm. uh, in this series, we're talking about the... Yeah, 3 a.m. 3 a.m. for Tripti and Ankit. And, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. So we've got... Yeah. Shout out to our Indian folks right now. Uh, for, for hanging out, especially so close to Diwali, too, by the way. Like, thank you. You're prepping up for a, a big festival, and you're staying up late with us. Hopefully, we're making it worth your time. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Um, so so the, the context of this is we were talking about using uh, different films uh, to demonstrate the different types of film endings or different types of endings out there. There are four different types of endings in all stories, that have happened over the last uh, thousands of years, and it's a sweet ending, a bittersweet ending, a semi-sweet ending, and then a bitter ending, right? Okay. And it's a combination of whether the character gets what they want, or a character will get what they want, what they need, neither or both, or a combination of neither or both. Um, okay. And so you're picking up, this is my favorite of the entire series, 
um, which is one of the hardest ones to pull off, which is the bittersweet ending. So let you take it away here. I'm just going back down to my chair. Hold on a second. Are you like also gradually squatting as you're? <laughs> yes. You're like doing the the elevator, you know, the escalator. Yeah, exactly. Move? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Is it possible to give readers what they want, not what they need, and still leave them satisfied? Love it. Great opener. Yes. It's the bittersweet ending, and it's really, really hard to pull off. That's because a lot of B2B writing is already unsatisfying because it gives the reader what they want without fulfilling the need and acts like it's done both. <laughs> That's funny. That's a spicy take. Uh, it's like when great lovers are terrible partners and act like they're amazing all around. Mm. Yep. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. First, I propose that's an unintentional consequence of thinking wants and needs are the same. And second, that's not what we're talking about. Um, okay. What we're talking about is intentionally withholding what the reader needs. And in fact, letting them actively reject their needs so they can pursue their goals while still delivering a complete, satisfying and honest ending. We've got a lot to cover, so let's dig in. I mean, I think it's a pretty great setup, Tommy. Let's hope I can deliver. Um, yeah, it's a good setup. Um, okay, the bittersweet. A quick refresher of wants and needs. So this was the previous emails? Yeah, this or... was what we were establishing throughout the, ser the series. Okay. At the heart of every story are two driving forces, what characters want and what they truly need. While they might chase after external goals, often fueled by misconceptions or the lie, there's also the truth that will lead them to genuine fulfillment. Okay. Uh, wants. These are tangible objectives characters chase, often driven by their beliefs or the lie. Needs. Beneath the surface, these are the deeper truths or the truth that characters must confront for genuine growth. Okay. Cool. In a story with a sweet ending, characters embrace the truth, reject the lie, and achieve both their wants and needs. But in a bittersweet narrative, they will cling to the lie, achieving what they want at the cost of their deeper needs. For instance, in the social network, Mark Zuckerberg achieves unparalleled success with Facebook, but at the cost of personal connections. Similarly, in The Truman Show, a oh, great film, Truman finds freedom, but fails to realize he can never live a normal life. Both films highlight a common thread. The heroes achieve their external goals, the wants, yet face unresolved internal conflicts, the needs, rendering their victories bittersweet. Okay. Um... Okay, so this wants and needs is part of what we need to know to understand the bittersweet ending. Yes. Yep. Okay, cool. Okay, I really wouldn't change it. It's a great setup. Wouldn't change too much there. The ghost, the truth, and the lie. Okay, get ready because we're about to dig deep. Every narrative is propelled by three intertwined elements. The ghost, the truth, and the lie. I feel like it would be really cool to see a visual here. Mm. Um. Because you've got this nice visual up here. Um, oh, I know I'm not sharing my screen, so. Yeah, we're talking about up here. Yeah, I like the visual up front, up top with the with the bittersweet want. It could be cool to see um, how they are intertwined, but I don't know, maybe not. Um, while we've touched on the latter two, the ghost is perhaps the most important element. Here's the relationship between the three. The ghost is a past event or trauma that haunts the character and fuels the lie. The truth is the reality they need to embrace that will liberate them from the ghost. The lie is a belief the character holds to be true because of the ghost and prevents the character from seeing the truth and fully resolving their character arc. Okay. Going back to the social network, Mark Zuckerberg grew up nerdy and ignored, so he believes he has to do something big to be noticed. His ghost is brought up in the opening scene, where a soon-to-be ex-girlfriend, Madeline, says, you're probably going to be a very successful computer person, but you're going to go through life thinking that girls don't like you because you're a nerd. And I want you to know from the bottom of my heart that won't be true. It'll be because you're an asshole. <laughs> This is the truth and Zuck refuses to believe it. In story, the truth is usually portrayed by one or two characters that try to keep the protagonist on track to getting what they want while tending to their needs. Truth in the social network is embodied by co-founder Eduardo Saverin. His attempts are displayed in a few key moments throughout the film. 
the initial investment he believes in steady growth and is cautious about spending too much too soon. Monetization strategy wants to monetize early by placing ads and ensuring financial stability. Skeptical of Sean Parker, more on this in a moment, freezing the bank accounts. He hopes this will for force Mark to reconsider their direction. The lie is likewise represented by one or many characters. In this case, it's represented by Sean Parker. Multiple investors. He wants hyper growth and raises capital from several high profile investors. Monetization. I'm just going to assume that the bullets are good, so I'm going to skip over them. Throughout the story, there are moments where the truth and the lie are at odds with each other. And at each turn, the protagonist follows the lie to take another step towards getting what they want. I, this is all so good. I, I mean, I, there's nothing that's giving me pause. I just think visuals, I'm really craving visuals. And mm. I don't know if that's because I'm a visual learner, um, but there is a lot of information, obviously, that is being thrown at the reader here. And I'm feeling slightly overwhelmed by the three. Mm. And so I'm wondering if, having visuals before before or after each of these bullet points that dives deeper into it with some sort of like, I'm pointing at this and these are like the um, the reason why this part exists, right? So the you could have a visual with the three and then for the ghost, it could be like past event or trauma, the truth, reality they need to embrace, right? And that visual could really help the reader stay on track with like where they are. Mm -hmm. um, so in the end, his ghost lingers, the truth is shunned, the lie embraced, and Facebook soars to its first million users, achieving what Mark always wanted to do something big. Yet we have to ask, will he ever be satisfied? Now let's flip the script. How does this narrative unfold in real life? What does your business represent? Much like characters in a screenplay, B2B buyers have our own ghosts, being burned by agencies, wasting budgets on unproductive freelancers, or investing in tools that didn't live up to the hype. Okay? So if I go back up to... The ghost definition, a past event or trauma that haunts the character and fuels the lie. Okay. So being burned by agencies, wasting budgets, and investing in tools that didn't live up to the hype is a past event or trauma. That makes me... Okay. I'm scrolling up and down because I'm trying to remember the definitions. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think visuals could play an interesting role in this. Um these ghosts set the stage for our own version of the lie. For illustration's sake, let's go with freelancers aren't worth it. If that's the lie, the truth we actively reject is maybe I could have written better briefs. Yet the underlying problem still exists. So when an alternative to a freelancer comes along like a shiny new tool, we pursue the lie, sometimes with reckless abandon. But wait, we're also part of business. And how we treat our customers' ghosts and lies is the foundation of our positioning, marketing, and sales strategies. Think about your prospects' ghosts' lies. How do you address them? The way I see it, you've got two options. Tommy, this is very good. I don't know if I'm going to have many edits. <laughs> Are you learning um, something? Mm hmm Okay. Mm hmm Feed the lie or tease the future. Play into the prospect's existing beliefs. Offer immediate satisfaction while downplaying the truth. Acknowledge the lie. Give them what they want. Let them know their need isn't being satisfied. And if they did embrace the truth, they would have an even brighter future. I struggle with this because feed the lie sounds pretty icky, but make no mistake, plenty of companies, though plenty of companies do, I do not endorse deceptive marketing tactics. What I am saying is confirmation bias is a powerful thing and it is a perfectly valid strategy to say, yes, what you're feeling is justified. Maybe the problem is bigger than you thought. Here's a solution. We can fix that right now. Okay, putting these concepts to work. Let's translate these narratives into action and create a blog post using an example that is relevant to our community. Situation, the company wants to scale content. Ghost, they were burned by agencies and freelancers last time they tried. Truth, maybe we didn't properly vet our collaborators or communicate a clear strategy. Lie, agencies and freelancers are terrible, so they need to find a different way to scale. Potential solution, an AI tool that can scale content output fast. Okay, ask yourself these questions. Answer these questions in great detail if you want to get in the reader's headspace. I'm wondering, Tommy, as I read through this, and I'm scrolling down... I'm wondering if it's it's so good. This is me nitpicking. Um, I'm wondering here. if if it's worth interspersing a bit of the B2B content marketing, like real life stuff, a bit higher up in the hypotheticals, because mm. there is a lot, there is a, a whole lot of context setting here. And I worry that, I mean, it just took all of that time 
to get to, you know, page six of 12. So half the time, um, getting to how does this play into your life and how can you use this to make your endings better, right? Um, by the time we get to putting these concepts to work, I have so much information in my head that it could be potentially overwhelming to now sit down and think, okay, I'm going to now apply this to my life. Mm -hmm. um, so I am wondering if all of this context is completely necessary, even though it's written super well and is great. Um, like, do you need to go into the entire social network metaphor um, or example? Or can you kind of run through it a bit quicker? And I'm... <laughs> Who knows? Naveen says, this feels like a script for a YouTube video. Eric is just looking for B-roll. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what does the audience think? Because like, there's, I'm not going to find anything with the writing here that could change. And I'm literally just looking for anything. Like, I'm basing it off of how I'm feeling right now, which mm. is, this is, this is new information. I've never heard this told this way before. Yeah. I feel... Like, I need to digest that a bit before I dive into putting these concepts to work. That's actually, I've gotten that feedback. Uh, and Tripti's on here right now. And um, one of the things that she said, and this is actually, it's actually kind of what I'm going for um, with the work that I produce. So I'm not, I'm not too mad at, the, uh, at this type of feedback. But it's, um, I need to bookmark it. I need to come back to it. And I need to like read it more so I can fully digest what it is that's being said. Yeah. Right. And that's actually intentional. Um, okay. And it's be like for me personally, um, I'm trying to uh, introduce concepts to this space that are familiar but foreign if that okay. makes sense. Um, yep. So when we look at, in screenwriting, for example, we talk about the ghost, we talk about the truth, we talk about the lie, um, needs, wants, all of that stuff. Um, it's actually all very relevant to who we are in real life when we look at like character analysis. What's mm -hmm. the lie that you believe to be true? Yeah. Right, when it comes to your life. What's the truth that you refuse, that you ignore or um or you just don't know like yeah as we think about our own personal character arcs you can definitely look back at your life and see different arcs of your character where you learned something new yep um i am personally trying to be very information dense yeah um with this because um that's something i feel like i see i don't see a lot of in this space right it's it's giving it's making it really easy and i actually want to challenge like for studio insider subscribers by the way and if you're not subscribed to the studio insider studio uh, content studio.com forward slash studio insider um i i want to introduce concepts that are a little bit more dense uh that way these like foundational principles are like embedded they're not like, you know, check out these hooks or try these hook templates or not. To, I'm mm -hmm. not like talking about hook templates. That sounds snooty, but. Um, no, it's fine. Totally. Hook templates suck. No. Um, the, the, the idea, like I, 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 I'm trying to be dense. Yeah. I think then, because I get that. And I think this is something I would have to read like three times. My, what I'm craving right now are these visuals. And I, I do wonder if that would help people digest the information a bit mm. faster so that they can, they don't have to read it like 10 times to really then put it into action because the density is good. But I just wonder if, if the visuals, and even as you get lower down um, to the, to the example intros, you could have like arrows or like squiggles pointing to be like truth, lie, you know, this and that, so that it's actually showing in the examples. Mm this is what you know this is what is happening and and here's how it all ties together um but yeah i, I don't think i would change much else okay 
Tripti says, uh, relief she's not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I, no, yeah. I mean, someone else gave me the feedback that um, it was like I like with reading these in particular, it's like I'm taking my brain and doing an mm -hmm. XML dump of all of it to make it all make sense. But it's still, even though it makes sense, it's uh, it still is all very dense um, because it's information rich. Um, yes, I can't help it because that's like that's I, I, I that's what I went to conservatory for. Like I focused half of my life on these exact concepts, so it's like it's you just to need be hard. an you just need an illustrative little like cheat sheet. I think yeah, yeah. Um, if if you can ha if you can give this to someone and have them illustrate it. I think that would literally solve that problem. And then you can still have it the exact same way, but you can have the illustration like side by side so that you are yeah. seeing it as you go through it. Like this needs to be kind of like a storybook, I guess, yeah. in my mind. Oh, that makes sense. I like that. Yeah. Um, Tripti says, I try the exercise of identifying the ghost, the lie and the truth, but that seems to keep me stuck on it. And I end up uh, with something too dramatic. It's actually supposed to be kind of dramatic. Um, mm. because even if you never use any of this stuff, like if you're the idea behind this overall, when we're looking at the output of this, right, I'm looking at this intro and the intro here is consider this AI will always deliver on time. Never misspell, always be grammatically correct, produce a ton of content at breakneck speeds and never give excuses and barely need editing all at a fraction of the cost of a freelancer or agency. Uh, just tell it what you want. With a little bit of prompting, you're off to the races. That said, there are some things you need to consider if you're contemplating replacing your writers with AI. This whole thing when we're talking about, and this is just for anybody who's like familiar with the series and has been following along with truth, lie, needs, wants, etc. The idea is to get inside your reader's head from a like very personal perspective, not from a, what is their search intent? It's like, yeah, we know that they're searching for this thing, but why are they searching for it? These are the elements. And if you are telling a very blown out dramatic story, like thinking about somebody sitting, at, like I said, I've been sitting at uh, my computer at three o'clock in the morning looking for answers um, for something yeah. and breaking out into a cold sweat, right? Because I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get that information in time, right? We have to consider what those stakes are because I know we've all been in some situation where we're searching for something because we're desperate. And then what we find does not consider that desperation at all. Right. And it's like, even if you never talk about any of that stuff, it's something that really gives you, uh, gives this whole underlying layer of life. So if it does feel dramatic, Tripti, that's actually great because um, that's where it's supposed to be. But how do we get to those insights? How do we connect to that character so deeply? Ooh, this is a whole, this is a whole nother conversation. Um, it's really, it's really about just, I mean, for me, it's a lot of just thought. It's a lot of pretending to be honest with you. Um, so let's, let's, oh, I could talk about this all day long. Um, <laughs> we don't have all day long and it's like three o'clock in the morning for you guys. Um, so no, the idea is, though, is like if we know what people want, if we're looking at search phrases, right, like that's very clearly telling us what people want. I want to know how to be more consistent in my podcasting schedule. Right. Why do they want that thing? Right. They want to know how to be more consistent with their podcasting so they don't disappoint their uh, audience. They don't lose um, subscribers or podcast or uh, uh, and, uh, advertisers, et cetera. What do they need, though? They need to know that they can produce high quality stuff um, on a consistent schedule. Not that they need to know that, but they need to prove their own self-worth to themselves or that they are as good of a creator as they think they are. Right. Um, does that make sense? Erica, am I making sense to you? Yeah, you're making sense to me. OK. Yeah. Um, and how do you connect to the character so deeply? It's really like, it's about asking these questions and like really meditating on those, on those answers, right? What is the lie that you believe to be true about whatever situation, 
really try and put yourself into those positions. I could talk about this all day long. I don't want to talk about it right now um, yeah. because we have one more. Uh, we have one more to go. Is there anything else you'd like to mention in there, Erica? I'm just reading it. I'm just I'm reading it and reading it and reading it um, to try to see if I can like understand why I'm feeling this this overwhelm, even though I know it's intentional. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm. I might actually want more. I know that it's already dense, but in the section where it says feed the lie or tease the future, I guess I want to know why, why should I do one or the other? What are the best cases for each? Um, like I want more in that mm. because it feels quite fast. Like play into the prospects, existing beliefs, offer immediate satisfaction while downplaying the truth. Or acknowledge the lie, give them what they want, let them know their need isn't being satisfied, and if they did embrace the truth, they would have an even brighter future. Feed the lie sounds icky, but um, I don't endorse deceptive marketing tactics. What I'm saying is confirmation bias is a powerful thing, and it's perfectly valid strategy to say, yes, what you're feeling is justified. Maybe the problem is bigger than you thought. Here's a solution you can fix right now. Like, I feel like all of this is about, you know, most, most commonly people tease the future, Feeding the lie is a gray area, so I understand why you wouldn't. And then it kind of just ends. Mm. So I would go deeper here because this is the transition paragraph between um, you've got this whole setup, then you've got what does your business represent? And then it's like, okay, how do we put this into practice? This is the transition. And and I want to, I think I want to know more about when do you feed the lie? What's a good, what's a good way to feed the lie? Mm. When do you feed the future? Why would you feed the future? Like, because maybe that's why people are getting confused and they, and they don't really know how to put it into action. Because once you put start putting these concepts into work, it's a little bit hard to tie the actual like examples back to like, why are we even doing this in the first place? Mm. Right. So I would write more. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I would write more in just in that section. I dig it. Yeah. Cool. Okay. That's all I have to say about it. It's really well written. It's really interesting. I think you'd like the rest of the series. Oh, I, I read most of them. I skimmed most of them last night because I knew you were going to send me one. Ah, cool. Yeah. But I did not really digest them. I'm going to go back and read them all again. Naveen says, that's for a paid consultation, Erica. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Erica. Uh-oh. Now I've got you. All right, let me give a bit of context to this. Um, okay, so this is something I wrote for CXL. It was the first piece I ever wrote for CXL. It was edited by Pep himself, which who's the the CEO and founder, or I don't know, is he still the CEO? No. Okay, no, he stepped down, but he founded it. Um, and he is a notoriously difficult editor. He made Tommy <laughs> cry, and he said that publicly, so I'm allowed to say that. Yeah. Um, he I'm does not. not <laughs> yeah, he does not believe in filler. He does not think filler should exist ever. Um, everything has to be active voice for the most for the most part, especially, um, and it has to be quick, snappy. Um, there, it has to be very, very example heavy. So that was the brief. Um, I'm very proud of this article, not necessarily the introduction, which I feel like you're going to rail on, but. <laughs> um, I'm quite proud of, especially when you get down to the section that's how to align storytelling with the marketing funnel with examples, and then anything below that. I'm quite proud of it. I um, minored in film studies in college, speaking of passions, and I never wanted to actually make the movies, but I like I, the whole point of the class was to watch the movies and then analyze the director's choices. So I spent a lot of my college career doing that. Um, and so I got to do a bit of that kind of at the end of this, which was fun. Um, so yeah, that's the context necessary for this. Yes, Pep does not believe in bullshit. <laughs> no bullshit from Pep. He's, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, um, and as the, uh, a little bit of context on my side, I was the first editor outside of Pep of Conversion XL. So this is one that would have run by me at one point in time. 
And my mm-hmm. first immediate, and you already know what I'm going to say, is where's the story in the intro? We're going to talk about storytelling, <clears throat> captivating our audience, and then we're going to go who, what, where, when, why, answer the proverbial five W's through storytelling, and you'll build meaningful connections with your audience. Yes, but tell me the story. I know. There's no story. Erica, there's no story. This was 2021, I think. I know it says 2023 on their website, but they just they keep yeah, updating no, that I've, date. I had stuff that I wrote 12 years ago that was published, like, that I wrote two weeks ago, apparently. I know. Yeah, so. Um, so just know that. And I love that we're doing this, too, because I always say this publicly. Like, if you don't cringe at your past work, you're not improving. <laughs> so I'm glad yeah. that I'm looking at this intro and going, what the hell? Yeah. And well, I remember writing this and being like, this is so good. <laughs> well, that's, so th- these are, the editing backstory is a bit chilling not gonna lie yeah the um so the the the, the thing with the, any of these types of so and I, I run the risk of this I ran the risk of this in the last one too where it's like how can you talk about in my case it was write better endings how do you talk about write better endings without a solid ending right how do yeah. we talk about I wrote one about writing better intros how do you do that without writing a better intro how do we talk about Erica how to give a guide on storytelling without starting with the story Right. Mm. Um, Yep. And you know that. I don't need to tell you that. You already know. Um, So the question would be, though, is like if I were editing this for anybody else, the question would be is how can I tell the same? How can I give the same um, uh, same advice? Right. But talk about do it in a story format. So not every not every piece of content needs to tell a story. I might actually even just kill all of that. Right. I would I would kill this. Don't do that. That's how much I want to kill it. Just get rid of it all. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll get rid of this. And we'll start with not every piece of content needs to tell a story. We did this a little bit earlier. Um, did this a little bit earlier in one of the other pieces, but now we're going to start with a reversal. Um, so how to captivate your audience. Not every piece of content needs to tell a story. Applying storytelling in the right place at the right time. And the right may- place makes all the difference. Then, yeah, but what is the right time, right place? Wait, what does that even mean? I hate that line. Well, that's where I would have you tell a story. Right. So that's exactly where, like, applying storytelling in the right place, right time, uh, right way makes all the difference. For example, somebody comes over to the website and they say, you know, or somebody comes to your website and I would just jump straight into a story, use that story to illustrate the right place and the right time. Right. Um, Naveen says, I actually yep. like the first line. It sets up the second one. I don't know, Erica, do you like the first line? Which one? In this the one. Who, what, when, where? Yeah. Mm. I don't know. No, not really. Okay. I'm the editor. I don't really like, it, like any of the intro. Look at me. I'm the editor now. <laughs> I'm getting punchy. It's the end of the day. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I would start with not every piece needs to tell a story, applying storytelling in the right place, right time, right way makes all the difference. Then give me an example through story of the right place and the right time. Is it the right place to tell a story? What's an inappropriate place to tell a story, Erica? Real quick. Like just. Is it... I mean, so this is for business storytelling, right? Yeah. So. I guess, like, you don't need to tell a story if you're um, just being like, hey, like a... Comparison pages. Comparison pages, totally, yeah. Yeah, we'll use that. We'll say comparison pages. We'll use that. Um, The right place to tell a story is, you know, top of funnel features, benefits, right? How does this thing apply to you? Um, If we're looking at a top 10 tools list... Right. We'll bring it back to earlier. Yeah. What's the story on how that would be useful? So I would use this right here. I would actually use this point to illustrate uh, when is and when is not a good time to tell a story. Um, yep. This is our most complete guide on how to apply the art of storytelling in your marketing initiatives. Uh, I hate that. Um, your mm-hmm. marketing initiatives to engage and grow your audience, when to use it and when not to. Um, yeah, we'll also look at examples of businesses that get it right, why their strategy is paying off. Okay. If you want to master storytelling, I'm going to 
Yeah. I didn't write that. I didn't write that last line. Okay. They wrote that. That's oh, all right. We'll we'll excuse it then. No, actually, I, th- I, I actually of all of these, I was going to say this is probably not a bad place to do it. Um, it's probably not a bad place to do that. I, they didn't have that course, I don't think, when I wrote this. Yeah. I can't remember. No, it's not a bad place for a call to action, though. And in fact, yeah. like in in a lot of cases, so we'll talk about. Um, I, I I heard the phrase not too long ago was uh, pitch slapped, and I love this. It's actually mm-hmm. not a bad place to do it because it's completely in context for everything that's being talked about, and it's weaved in beautifully. And it's above the fold, but it's also yeah. something that's not distracting from the entire thing. Um, so yeah, this, I mean, this feels pretty standard fare to me. Yep. It's not bad, um, but I would love to see like the intro, like a story just to bridge those two things together here. Totally. Um, what is storytelling? It's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. <laughs> it's not your fault. Um, <laughs> Storytelling is the sharing of information through a contextual narrative. What does that mean? Um, yeah, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it allows you to take a set of facts and ideas. I'm gonna see. I'm so much meaner than you are. That's terrible. I feel terrible. You're like, no, your article is good, and I'm just gonna rip it apart line by line. Erica, we're not gonna be friends after this. No worries, Tommy. Bring it on. <laughs> um, so no, what is storytelling? So obviously, we're going after the featured snippet here. Um, yep. The takes a set of facts and communicates them in an audience in an engaging way. If your story resonates, educates, and informs, you'll likely build deeper connections. I would. I would never write that today. I've got no idea what that means. You know. Yeah, it's. Um, it doesn't say anything. Right. Well, and it's 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 uh. Yeah, and it, it storytelling is not about taking a set of facts and ideas and communicating them in an, in an engaging way. It's about empathy. It's about, you know, how do you sum all of that up in eighty characters in general? But it's about building empathy, right? Yeah. Like it's how would you say what what is storytelling to you now, Erica? I've written it in another place. Hang on, I can literally tell you because I just wrote this the other day. Um, so the other day I wrote the stories we tell build familiarity and trust. You may not know me at all, but if I tell a story you can relate to, you'll feel closer to me. When we tell stories while we take readers on a narrative transportation, this journey can change how people think, act, and view the world. Um, I think that's way more interesting than what I wrote there. Yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is about empathy. It's about resonance. It's about connection. Yeah, it's about um, yeah, connection, empathy. It's uh, talking about the universal experience. Yeah. Right. Something that we can all relate to, um, even if we have things that are separate from each other. We have our own separate lives. We have our own separate experiences. There are still shared collective experiences storytelling is what taps into those collective experiences to drive empathy um, and uh, give perspective on any given subject to deliver themes um, along those lines. Yeah. Right. Uh, And this is, I mean, this is, this is clinical. Um, Yeah. Yeah. How storytelling helps you attract and grow audience. So I thought this was actually really interesting. Um, I actually cited this uh, study in like 2012 um, mm-hmm. on the uh, on storytelling on conversion XL actually. Um, but I think that the, I mean, this is a fascinating study. Uh, researchers at Princeton University set for the brain activity of both speakers and listeners under the pretext that communication is a joint activity. Yep, using FR- MRI. Um, a great story literally binds us together. I love that. Speaking to your audience's needs, intent, goals, and desires throughout the customer journey drives desired action. Um, yeah, yeah, it's not necessary. Yep. Uh, take outdoor clothing company, Patagonia, for example. So what we haven't gotten to in these, uh, 148 words yet is how it actually helps attract and grow audience. Um, This is great. I mean, it's great research. But 
there's a connection here, I think, between the attract and grow. Like, there's the attract. There's there's something missing. I don't know what it is, but there's something missing. Um, yeah. So I think it's a cool setup with the study. Yeah. And then I could again go into a little story about how you know when you um like so after you say a great story literally binds us together you can be like i could be like you know when a when an ad makes you like talks to you about this and this is your problem and it solves it for you like you feel this like when yeah. a campaign does that when an article does that you feel that like make it obvious you know like set visual set visualizations um, and then get into the Patagonia example. Yeah. That would probably be, probably be a much better way to do it. Yeah, I think so. All right. Take out work tools in uh, Patagonia, for example. They use storytelling to connect with their audience as demonstrated. Above the fold on their four-fifths of Grizzly book excerpt about micro... Okay. Being a well-known billion-dollar company gives them flexibility in their landing page structure. If nobody knew who they were, this vague messaging above the fold wouldn't work. Okay. So... This is interesting to me for the reason that we're talking about attract and grow audience. Yeah. But then we're saying that Patagonia is a billion dollar company and this wouldn't, if nobody knew who they were, this vague messaging wouldn't work. Totally. Right. So maybe if we're talking about, it's a great case study. It's a great example. Um, the question would be is can we use a different example for somebody who needs to attract attract and grow audience with story, if story is your only competitive advantage, how does that work? And then how does it work um, with Patagonia here? Yeah, I think it's a bit of a a bit of a weird example um, as well because they're so big, yeah. you know. And I know CXL's audience is advanced, but the examples I give lower down are much more achievable i would say yeah. to their reader than what patagonia is doing and it's funny because after after this i think they added to their guidelines like a year later you know like never use like apple like never use google like don't right. use these big brands right and so i totally like i think it's the wrong choice especially as the first example yeah it's just it, it's with this it's like if we're talking about attracting and growing then like it's that delivering on that subhead Right. Yep. Because we're, I mean, by 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 admission, this actually doesn't work, or yep. it wouldn't work if if we didn't know who they were. Um, yeah. But the idea is, I mean, the idea is great. Uh, let's see. So of course they still want consumers to buy a jacket only if they need to, and with the intent of wearing it for a long time. <coughs> <they're communicating> just, <coughs> yeah. Okay. You see this message and everything they promote. Through the power. Narrative of young generation activists. Yeah. Erica, I can't edit you. <laughs> what were we if it were up to me developmentally and SEO wasn't a thing, yeah. I would just cut this whole section and just go right to how to align storytelling with your funnel. Yeah. Because I'm not really learning anything from this. Yeah. Yeah. Good story influences customer motivation. I mean, even if it were SEO, like, even with SEO in mind, this doesn't would this even have any value to, I mean, this doesn't have any value to the search element no. of it anyways. Just literally the, what is storytelling H2? Yeah. Is the only reason that that's there, but like, I don't get why, how storytelling helps you attract and grow. Like it doesn't, it just doesn't answer it very well. Yeah. All right. How to align storytelling with the marketing. Okay. Okay. All right. It's possible without a deep understanding of your target audience. Yep. Okay, that said, collecting data, disability, storytelling, mechanisms and trends, needs, demands, goals, pain points. Storytelling like your business cannot survive in stasis. Once you know where your audience is in the customer journey, you can uh, unite an idea, untie, <laughs> unite <laughs> an idea with emotion to drive action. Okay. Focus on shared interests. Okay. Um, so you're actually doing a really great job here, uh, with the examples, right? Mm -hmm. But like focus on shared interests and values, speak to passions, relatable 
this still feels very this feels clinical very clinical right we're talking about i could have told a little story at the beginning of each one of these to build intrigue and then be like yeah what i would want to see get into it what i would want to see through like through this is the story i would want to what i would advise an author to do in this scenario is like let's build a hypothetical customer journey and we're talking mm. about this one person going through all these different steps and then showing how a business does like we're, we're starting with it hypothetically and then we'll show how a company does this part of this thing really well yep and then keep them moving through totally um i actually do that I do that quite a bit. 80% of wealth simple clients are under 45. Um, yeah, I mean, the main thing here, and you already know this, the main thing here is just I need more story to weave through yep. the storytelling story. Totally. There's not much story in this article. There's, there's no story in this article. We're just reporting on other people, which yep. is um, – that's the major thing is I would, it, and if I were to go through this like section by section um, as a full edit, I would be looking at that and going like, where's the stories? How do we weave the story together? Let's put all this together. And then I would say, now let's, let's give it back to me once we have that. Totally. In play. A hundred percent. Cool. Well, yeah, I don't know if there's much more I could say. This is a long piece. Uh, we got mm -hmm. 22 pages here. It's also the end of the day. Um, yep. I want to say thank you to uh, the folks who are still watching. We still have uh, quite a few people hanging out with us right now. Um, Amazing. Yeah. So we're going to end it right there. This has been a long, long edit-a-thon. Uh, I really appreciate everybody taking the time today to spend with us. Uh, I hope you got a lot out of it. Um, Erica, is there anything that you would want to leave folks with after uh, after all this? I mean, I think if you watch this and you feel motivated to do any of the creative stuff that we talked about, I don't want you to feel deflated if it doesn't get accepted by who you're writing for. Mm. Because I do think that a lot of people are kind of stuck playing this SEO game still, even though there's there's people leading thoughts on why that should not be the case. Um, and it can be very frustrating as a freelancer when you are beholden to these guidelines and these editors that just want to get content out. So I would say, you know, you got to make a living. So you've got to write how you've got to write. But um, if you can find the people that are talking about changing it for the better and try to get in their orbit and try to write for them, um, if that's what you want, then I would recommend doing that because there are people that are trying. Um, but otherwise, you know, keep exploring this with your own writing on social and stuff and do what you can to, to improve it and try not to let the industry beat you down. <laughs> Cause it can just be, it can be hard to listen to this and, and want to try all these cool things. And then you send it to an editor and they're like, you know, make it more clinical. And it's like, Ugh. right. You know? So that's, that's just my one thing is like, you got to make a living, but there are people out there, you know, trying to make it better. So you can find them. And, and I would advise trying to, if what we said kind of really speaks to you. Yeah, I would, I would, I would add to that and say, like, if you aren't the industry right now, from what I can see on my LinkedIn is we're all trying. We just don't, nobody has the answer yet. We all want to have the answer. Um, and I think as a community, it's going to take us to be uh, a little bit more brave to step out um, and, and push forward a little bit. But also, yeah. um, as if you're a freelancer, and I know a lot of folks who watch the show are, um, be willing to push just a little bit. And if it's, you know, something like incorporating wants and needs, like, even if it's stuff that's never explicitly, even if it's not on the surface, there's still this extra work that can be done on this bottom layer where you can use it to really connect with people. We talk about search intent, but we're thinking about that from a very clinical perspective instead of like, why, why is this person real? Like, what is, what is the real human being reason that somebody might be searching for this thing? Um, yep. 
I don't see that nearly enough, and I think that that's something that um, it's going to be just uh, for me. It's a lot more gratifying putting that level of work into it before I even write a word, uh, because then it's like you can you can sleep easy at night knowing that you've actually tried to help somebody instead of just feed yeah. feed the engine, because that never feels good. Because then it feels like yeah. what am I even doing any of this for? You know, that's not why I got into writing. So, um, cool. Well, uh, thank you, everybody who's been following along so far. Uh, if you are not part of the Studio Insider uh, email newsletter, go to thecontentstudio.com forward slash Studio Insider. We'll have uh, events like this where only Studio Insiders are able to submit. Um, we also have a number of other cool things that are happening, like the Write Better Ending series. We have some more series that are coming up in the near future. Also, shout out to Ahrefs for being our sponsor for this and uh, the rest of the show. And uh, yeah, Erica, any place where we can find you online? Where should we, where should we be looking for you? Erica's my name uh, is the best place for now. I've got a newsletter called Power Your Platform, and I will be launching my own newsletter soon as well. So keep your eyes out for that. Um, I just need to figure out a name, uh, which just drives me crazy because I'm terrible at names, but we'll get there. <laughs> um, and yeah. Yeah, that's the best way for now. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. And some of you, please get some sleep. Yeah. <laughs>